I don't know. I would love to see a vehicle fly just on. I, I'm trying to think right now if there has ever been a hydrogen powered first stage that does not have an ablative uh, nozzle like the because the Delta Four Heavy is hydrogen first stages and Delta Four, but it has a ablative carbon nozzle, so it sh still shoots a bright orange flame because it's ablating that that mm. carbon nozzle. So it's still really bright orange, and you don't get that like fun transparent. But I would love to see if doesn't really make sense on a booster stage, but I would like to see that. Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. Let's face it, he needs no introduction here. Tim and I, along with Ben Sullins, hosted the weekly Our Ludicrous Future podcast for something like a couple of years there. Um, we still get together and do reunion shows from time to time, but with all the talk of Starship finally launching to space, I wanted to bring Tim on here to talk about that, especially since, as many of you know, he's been picked to go on one of those things around the moon for the Dear Moon mission. Tim's made a name for himself as a rocket expert and one of the top YouTubers covering not just SpaceX, but NASA, ULA, Rocket Lab, Firefly, Relativity, uh, Stoke is a new one, many more. It's a crazy time for space travel, and as he likes to say, He's Team Space, but look, let's be honest. You guys already know all this. You're here for the conversation, so I'll just stop talking. Here's my conversation with my good friend, Tim Dodd. So um, I know it's far in the future, and I know there's only so much of this that you can talk about, but I mean, all of us are watching the, the Starship thing just from a distance, being like, this is really cool and everything, but you're probably going to be on one of those at some point. <laughs> like emotionally what is that i mean does that amp things up a little bit for you i mean you're already pretty amped up anyway because you're like super into this but i mean oh, is, yeah. there, is there any part of you when you're watching it's just kind of like oh my god i'm gonna be on that thing someday. oh a lot of me a is, lot of you yeah, yeah yeah i mean very much like you know i i watched the first ones and you know watched four of them blow up you know like <laughs> all the explosion of it you know yeah. um and and I'm still having and there might be some like psychological uh getting over that aspect that will that will have to occur during training and things like I don't know the implications of you know I and my reasonably deep bit of knowledge on on vehicles and and history and stuff like am I going to have to overcome some of that to actually get to the point where I'm comfortable sitting in a seat like I don't right now I'm like yeah this sounds awesome I also have a lot of faith that by the time I and other humans fly in this thing, it'll be flown a lot and, mm -hmm. and you know, all the, the major, you know, standing issues are, are solved and like well within a healthy margin. But, you know, uh, it will be, it would be really scary to watch one of these things blow up like right off the pad or something and, and really just see it, which is a, a reasonable for a vehicle the size with this complexity, with this new nature of so many things they're doing. It, it's not unheard of. It's not, I mean, no one wants it to blow up on the pad, especially, especially SpaceX does not want it to blow mm. up on the pad. Um, but honestly, yeah, that might honestly make it really hard to want to ever get on one of those, seeing a completely, you know, fully fueled vehicle like that. Yeah. Blow up, you know, I have a, I have a theory that maybe, and you can tell me to screw off on this, but like <laughs> that, um, I just feel like it's going to take a really long time to get that thing human rated and um, that something like a deer moon type mission could be more likely pulled off by going up in dragons and then just like docking. And then I would love that right now. Like as far yeah, as yeah, like, yeah. just frankly from a, I mean, human rating standpoint, obviously like that makes sense to me. It mm -hmm. would also be a lot more expensive and I don't think SpaceX is going to offer that up most likely um, it would be three. Wait, no, no. It would be at least to get all of those people, two. at least two or three launches just to at get the people two. up there. Yeah. And then well, they'd the have to refuel it. Right. Exactly. That's already, yeah, that's definitely already in the cards is the refuel. The good that's thing is you could put all cargo, launches. you could put all cargo, like, you know, these dragons could be launched with five people. They originally were designed for seven, but with, you know, ISS considerations and all that, yeah, they, yeah. they fly with four, but the vehicle could pretty easily fly with five or six. Mm -hmm. um, so you can fit, you know, a crew of like for a dear moon sized crew, you can fit to uh, do that and the humans and two launches on Falcon nine. Um, but yeah, you still have to do the re orbital refueling, um, all that stuff. That's still the same consideration there. Yeah. Um, but the good news is dear moon will not be the first crewed flight. Jared Isaacman and Polaris three will be the first one. And 
I, I honestly, uh, just speaking purely from, from myself, uh, and having been around Jared and his crew and his, his consideration with, uh, not only space flight, but also the way he handles, uh, aeronautics and seeing him with his, with his, uh, fighter jets and stuff makes me realize, okay, if this guy trusts it, like that puts a lot of faith for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good confidence booster. Is and and again, obviously, obviously, nothing against you know professional astronauts that are you know NASA trained astronauts. That that's just a different level of certification, like literally, and a different way of doing things. And these are people that are accepting a certain risk posture, as opposed to someone paying for it on their own. You know, like, hey, I'm here, but Jared's involvement in in the success of those missions and his personal you know knowledge base and stuff really that that helps me a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I get that. And, and also, to that same degree, with, with uh, Yusaku Maezawa having flown on Soyuz mm-hmm. and having been trained as a as a you know a cosmonaut, going through all that training also really helps me in this situation too. Knowing again, like someone's been through this, they have a lot of training and expertise that I can that I can lean on and and mm-hmm. you know read the room on in, in a sense. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's yeah. cool. So here's my hypothetical for you. Yeah. I got a big hypothetical. So let's just say, I know we're going into, uh, let's just say territory here, but um, five to seven years before a dear moon thing could actually happen. Okay. I think that's a fair amount of time, don't you? I would hope by then, yes. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> Very so much. you have a choice, hypothetical. Okay. Of in five to seven years doing the dear moon thing or right now, doing like an Axiom launch up to the ISS. Dear Moon. Yeah, you would hold off for that? Oh, for sure. Because of the Moon thing? Moon thing, I the crew, the fact that it's like... You've gotten to know them at this point. And, yeah, and who they are. Like the fact that it's... Um, I mean, obviously nothing against wealthy individuals that might fly with Axiom. Um, you know, so far everyone that's flown there has been actually impressive people. And uh, I think it... I also, I think spaceflight to that degree reflects like it takes a pretty outstanding individual to to want to be um, doing something of that sure. magnitude, you know. Um, but also, just yeah, the, the crew and the thoughtfulness behind Dear Moon and the whole idea of how it could be impactful and sharing through artwork and different perspectives and different creative mediums is something that I we've never seen before. Mm-hmm. I just don't know the implication of like what that you know, and it might not have a huge, it might not have a huge impact. You know, I, I'm totally willing to accept that as well, but it might impact one person's life. It might impact, you know, there might be a few people along the way that it, that it really, really, really makes a big difference to. Um, it might not be this global phenomenon of like, oh my God, now everyone understands spaceflight because people from all around the world came together and rode this rocket around the moon. Like I, I'm not going to, you know, mm-hmm. sing Kumbaya and think that's exactly what's going to happen, but there's a certain poetry to, to the aspect of it being, um, you know, individuals from literally all around the world with completely different perspectives and different beliefs and different, you know, lifestyles and everything. Um, it, it just has a, a big potential to me to be something really, really special. I do remember when they first announced Dear Moon and we were doing our podcast and I was kind of like, I don't get it. And you kind of lost your shit. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what? This is amazing. How did you do that? I, we should go back and listen to that. That's it. I forgot. Mm. Yeah, you're right. Mm. You're right. And I, and for me at the event, I teared up a little bit. Like I literally yeah. teared up and thought like, this is amazing. And I, I don't, I think I've told you this story before, but literally when, when I left there, my mom called or text, I was trying to, I was actually trying to look back. Cause I know like iMessage and stuff, you can go pretty far back, but this was oh, yeah, yeah. 2018. I couldn't get that far back in an archive, but um, my mom, I think she texted me or called me. I don't remember which one it was and said, you're not going on that thing. Right. <laughs> and I go, mom, I'm not qual like, you know, I'm my hundred percent. Like, there's no way I would ever get chosen for this. Like just objectively, I wasn't being like humble or, you know, trying to be humble or anything. Like I just thought, you know, at that point I had, and it's not about the YouTube subscribers. It doesn't mean that you're some special person or anything, but I just thought there's no chance that I would ever be selected for something like this, you know? And, and it was just, I laughed her off of the conversation of like, mom, be serious. Like why on earth would they, know who I am or think about, you know, choosing me. And then mm. five years later, here we are. That's awesome. Pretty, pretty wild Willy Wonka esque story. <laughs> um, 
don't know if I would want to do it. It's funny. People always ask, would I go into space? And I'm kind of like, only when it's just like the same as getting on an airplane for me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a pioneer in that, right. which is funny because like I said, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut more than anything. And now I'm, I don't know, maybe I've. I mean, I'm still in this fairly similar vein. I, I, I don't have a high risk posture. Either. Like I don't want to lose my life on a space flight mission. This is not worth me losing my life over. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like I, I'm expecting it to be a certain level of safety. Um, you know, but it, frankly, I mean, I, I trust Dragon a lot. Like looking at Dragon sure, now, yeah. like that's incredible. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like they have developed a, a robust system, and I would fly on that in a heartbeat now. Yeah. And before yeah. it flew, I would I didn't have that. I wouldn't mm -hmm. have I would have wanted to, and I didn't want to. I've said that often in live streams. Like, I, I don't want to go to space. I don't care. And that's never also been a thing though. Like I've never. <laughs> you never had the opportunity. Never had the op and it like. And when that actually is potentially just even a, far, a one in a literal literal million chance with Dear Moon, like when you're given that chance, like you kind of have to say yes because it's the opportunity of a lifetime, you know. So I don't know. I I, I I'm surprised that my mind changed as well. <laughs> <Let's put it laughs> Am I really doing this? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I, would it, be. I mean. What a crazy opportunity, though, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, I was yeah. I was super thrilled when I found out. Well, when you when you when you he, he did let me know a little bit ahead of time, everyone. Yeah, yeah. I felt really special for a while there. <laughs> crazy times, man. Yeah. Oh, it feels like I'm super happy for you. Thank you. I I'm I'm excited. I, my goal specifically with Dear Moon um, is I would like to be mostly done chasing live streams, you know, when we were talking mm -hmm. about that earlier, mm -hmm. just because I feel like that will be another thing that will take up a lot of schedule, a lot of effort, a lot of time um, that I really, by then I want to have my audience weaned off the ideas that I'm going to be there covering all these launches, you know, and maybe we spin off something and, and if we want to use my equipment and have other people run live streams, like that might be an option as well. I'm imagining on the Dear Moon launch, people going to be like, so you're going to live stream this? Yeah. Well, I want to. I would love to Try Could to you even do that from inside. I mean, I can see recording it, but I mean, yeah, I think so with Starlink and stuff these days. Heck yeah. Uh, okay. So I'm going to push for it. Well, I was, my joke was that like, you would be like cheering on, wait, no, I'm supposed to be in that thing. Wait, yeah. <laughs> like, wait, this is that one. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing so many. I just lost count. I'll get back to Tim in just a second, but first let me thank today's sponsor NordVPN. So if you're like Tim and you drive around to launches, events, family, whatever, you probably bring your work with you on your laptop. I know I do. And the more I do it, the more I make sure to protect myself on public Wi-Fi networks. That's what a VPN is all about. And that's why you've probably heard of NordVPN at this point. Anytime you're on a public Wi-Fi, you're vulnerable to all kinds of threats. But NordVPN is, it's like an invisibility cloak. It makes it look like you're literally in another country. That whole I'm in another country trick is also pretty cool because it gives you access to things in other countries you wouldn't have access here or wherever you might be. Like take Netflix, for example. When they sign shows, they actually sign them for specific territories because the rights holders might be different in other territories. So if your favorite show isn't on Netflix, guess what? It might actually be on Netflix in another country. So with NordVPN, you can watch that show. Geography means nothing to you. But that's just the start. NordVPN also offers threat protection, so if you accidentally click on any malware links, which are everywhere, by the way, it'll put a stop to that. And you've got the dark web monitor that'll let you know if your passwords or credentials get leaked anywhere. The point is, you can feel safe and protected with NordVPN. Each account protects up to six devices. They've got 24-hour support if you're new to VPNs and feel a little intimidated by it all. But just go to nordvpn.com CWJ, like Conversations with Joe, CWJ. Do that to get started, and if you sign up for their two-year plan, you'll get four months free, and that's at all levels, even their deluxe complete level. Plus, they've got a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you've really got nothing to lose, just, just to go give it a try. So trust me, this, this isn't something you want to learn about the hard way. <laughs> so go do it. Protect yourself. That's nordvpn.com slash CWJ. It's good for you, and it helps support this podcast. Thanks, NordVPN, for supporting this episode. And now, back to Tim. Thank you. I know what we can talk about just real quick, and it's a, a weird, like... Okay, so I just redid my whole setup, right? Yes, it looks incredible. Thank you for that. It's kind of sepia it. tone, isn't it? It's like, I, I don't have any natural vintage. color to my face, so I had to add it. You know? 
it's got a slight vintage feel to it, which I love. Yeah, yeah. Which With is... my vintage cameras back there and exactly. vintage globe. Yeah. Um, I am sort of not getting away from the science stuff, but I talk about history stuff a lot and mysterious topics. Those usually do well. So I am kind of like, I don't want to say broadening, pain, leaning toward it, you know. Broadening. Broadening. Yeah, that's a good, there you go. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I think it's a little bit more reflective of that. But so, okay, like I think about you a lot. Oh, I think about for you. many reasons. But but specifically, when I was redoing all this, like I'm not. I, I went to film school. I know how to make movies. I know how to write stuff and whatnot. But I am not technical, and I never have been. And so, like, I had an old iMac Pro that I was using. And I kept running into issues with recording and glitches and stuff like that. And I wanted to boost my videos up to 4K so that I could. How far do I want to go down this rabbit hole? <laughs> so I used to I'm always in move already. around. I know. Well, was, well, so I used to always move around the set. You know, I would like yeah. move up and back and everything, and the camera would stay still. Yep. Um, the problem there is that I have to use a lavalier mic because if I use a boom mic, it gets louder and softer depending on where I'm sitting and whatnot. So um, the the biggest change here is that I'm sitting in one spot. And, and because I'm shooting 4k and outputting 1080, we can pop in and do, yep. you know, that kind of thing. And, um, so anyway, since I'm shooting 4k, my old computer just wasn't quite up to task. So I got a new Mac pro and I did all this stuff and, um, and I'm having so much trouble getting it all to work together. Mm. And, and like, I've been using an A10 mini pro from black magic, but it only outputs 1080p. So I had to get a PCI card for the computer. And it's just like this whole thing. And now my tangent cam won't go through that same deck and da, 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 da. I've got a guy coming tomorrow that can hopefully straighten me out on all this, but, but like, I'm sitting here like struggling so much with a two camera setup. And then I'm thinking about how you have a van with like <laughs> 40 channels of 8k video running through it and stuff. And I'm just like, how the F? Did he pull this off? Like, how did, like, it's, it's, it's your guy, Andrew, right? It's Andrew. It's, I was going to say, it's not just me. That's the key. Yeah, if it yeah. was just me, it'd be basically eight cell phones being like, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. I'm, I'm on you know, one tripod. I, yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously, like, I, you know, come from a photography and video yeah, background. Yeah. So I do, I do enjoy the, the gear aspect of it. But uh, no, I, yeah, it's, it's a sickness. Um, the other thing <laughs> I would recommend, I, I still, and I've told you this for years, I still don't understand why you don't just record locally under your cameras. Mm -hmm. It's extra steps. So few steps. So few steps, Joe. So few extra steps. How many? I'm older than you. Um, the steps <laughs> add up. By two years? And, See and how, how great often, this has gotten? Come on, I can't How often more. do you record a video twice a week? Um, how often are you? Are you sending off footage twice a week, three times a week? Let's say five times a month. So a little okay. more than once a week. So the time difference is you hitting stop on OBS and having it begin syncing to Dropbox or whatever, or whatever you're using mm -hmm. versus taking the memory card out, putting it in, mm -hmm. dragging that file into your Dropbox mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Don't underestimate my laziness. So maybe maybe five extra minutes per month <laughs> tops well it may come down to that i don't know i mean well, it's, put it's a, keep I'm... a card reader plugged in so it never moves doop, 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 if it doop, could run doop. out and record externally onto something i could just go and switch it out or something but, maybe but you can switch out Why is well, so what do you what do you record on then if you got that in, in the van you got all the, the lines going through and stuff like Almost all of those cameras record locally. So we almost use Z cams for like so much stuff. And they're just recording on CFast. When you're done, you pop it out, put it in CFast card reader and throw it on a computer. Sorry, what's CFast? It's like a, it's a fat, gross, antiquated media instead of like a what, SD the card. Old, the old ones? It looks like it, but it's not actually. It looks almost exactly like a, a yeah CF card. CF, yeah. It looks exactly like it. So about the exact same dimensions, they are completely different. Um, and completely incompatible, but they're called <laughs> so yay life. Um, but that's yeah, see fast cards. Um, yeah, but it's the same thing. Like, who care? Why is it more convenient to unplug like a, a hard drive and plug that hard drive in versus unplugging a memory card and plugging that in? Do you have to open a door? Is the door scary? I just feel like <laughs> I should be able to do it. <laughs> is it wait? Oh, actually. Is it because is your door on the in the battery compartment where it's like next to your tripod and you don't want to adjust your camera every time? On um, this one, it would be, yeah, yeah. 
Actually, yeah. Get a different camera. On the main one, not so much. (laughs) I don't know. I that to me is such a non-issue for a much more reliable recording solution and and doing it the right way because like recording into OBS is. mm. Well, I I don't use OBS anymore for what it's worth, but that's good. Yeah. What are you using now? Uh, It's called Ecamm Live. It's a Mac specific um, program app, whatever. Um, OBS got to where like it would literally just freeze my computer. Oh yeah. I would open it up and the whole, I would have to restart my computer. <laughs> you had updated it and stuff. Done with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I updated it. Yeah. It was just I had hilariously decent luck with OBS. Like most problems that persist have nothing to do with OBS itself. Have like mm. some other, I don't know. I actually have a, I, speaking of computers, I have a, like a gaming PC now. I saw like, like your Instagram post or something about it. Yeah. Well, yeah. To be fair, there it's twofold. It was the realization. Okay, so I went out to Amsterdam in February, right during Static Fire. You know, there's literally been two things on my calendar for two years, yeah. and that's 33 engine Static Fire and the orbital launch of this and yeah. uh, of, of Starship. And of course, uh, like three months before that, I took a gamble and and you know, like said uh, for Kerbal Space Program, like you know, I had to sign an agreement and all this stuff, and you know, make commitments. I committed to coming out to this event mm-hmm. in Amsterdam and I'm like, I actually, I think I'm in the clause. I, I had, if it's a launch, I can't come and I have to cancel. Mm-hmm. But I will, I will still come out if it's static fire. And of course I missed it, missed static <laughs> fire because I was out there to see Kerbal Space Program 2, which I was, I mean, I shouldn't be putting life on hold like that because that was like one of the coolest experiences of my life was just not only, I love Amsterdam, beautiful city. I've never been, I'd love to go. Oh, it's top, top three favorite yeah. cities for sure. I'm not a huge, like, I don't love cities I, in mm-hmm. that world. I think it's probably top, top two favorite cities. I can't think of another one offhand, but I love it. Um, it's just beautiful. And, uh, but then just a playing Kerbal Space Program too, like, you know, b- like right as soon as possible was awesome. Mm-hmm. And then hanging out with everyone is so funny. You know, we're, there's a handful of other creators like Scott Manley. Yeah. So he went. Um, and Matt and uh, just, and f- a flow from our team was out there with me. And it was just so fun to be able to hang out with people. That was, that made it so worth it. And just meeting that the dev team too, from, from, from Kerbal was super, super fun. But the moral of the story is, um, you know, I, I put a lot of life on hold because of starship events and stuff. And, and, uh, and of course now the, the one that's crazy right now is as of the re- recording of this, we're six days away from what might be an imminent test flight. Finally, a full stack mm-hmm. orbital test flight. I'm looking at, we're hearing April 10th. Um, the FAA has some stuff. There's Marine things. There's basically everything that they need to launch. Uh, we're expecting, I mean, people are literally like refreshing Twitter, expecting SpaceX to say something and media is expecting to like get an official invite and all that stuff, uh, like literally imminent. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that being said, uh, Mary Liz and Ryan, who are my partners, you know, and, and all the recordings like down there and, and live streams and stuff, you know, with cosmic perspective, uh, I know I've talked about them a handful of times with, with you and, mm-hmm. uh, my good, good friends are getting married Saturday, the 15th in Florida at Yuri's night, Florida. Like before you that's coming up too, yeah. Yeah. Are you going to that? I've only been that one time and it always sneaks up on me and I never think to like plan ahead for it. I know it does. It sneaks up. I really enjoyed it too. I've been wanting to go back. Yeah. Well, (laughs) uh, of course. Now ironically, like I I think I'm gonna would have to miss their wedding if if they would potentially launch on the fourteenth or fifteenth, but I don't want it to come to that. And of course, like Again, there's only like three things ever on my calendar and two of them are Starship and then anything else on the calendar is like absolute nerve wracking. Like, uh, yeah, I don't know how we got on that topic, but yeah, I do have a gaming PC. (laughs) (laughs) Follow this storyline. Yeah, wow. God, no wonder we could never stay on topic with our ludicrous future because all of us do these like Uh. whirlwind of thought trains and somehow sometimes land back at the where we were supposed to go but oftentimes get interrupted and then all of us are doing that for two hours mm-hmm. i miss it i miss it too i uh, think that i think that i think that's what people liked about it though we just kind of like rambled and just <laughs> that's all podcasts are anymore right just yeah it's true it's just a, it's a good it's a good time to i think podcasts these days have filled the role of uh i don't know i think people are over like People want to be entertained, especially like on their way to work and back and 
uh, you know, on their lunch break and things like that. You know, I'm like for my lunch break, I, I always just pull up YouTube and yeah. you know, if there's not something new, then like, I'm like, what, what do I do? <laughs> you know, <laughs> people just, I think, scramble for, for good content that they, that they jive with, you know? Yeah. So I have a, I have a theory, like how much comfort viewing do you do? And define do, comfort. Viewing. Define comfort view. Okay. So like I will find myself watching rug cleaning videos for oh. like hours and I watch um, wood turning videos, like people doing oh. like lathes and lathes. stuff and like making bowls and pottery out of wood. Um, what's some of the others that I wind up falling into? Uh Oh, uh, like city tours, like walking tours of cities and stuff like that. People just like walk around trains, with the camera. Train trains. Tours. I watch so many trains. Um, I mean, am I alone in this? I feel like that's a. I've heard. I've heard other people talk about how much they watch comfort stuff as well. Uh, some if I depends. Sometimes I'll get in that routine of having something like that up while I'm like working. Yeah, yeah. It depends on what kind of work I'm doing. If I'm doing script work, then I, I can't have anything audio. So then like mm -hmm. a train thing or something like that is something that exactly. I might have. Yeah, yeah. Um, but otherwise, like, I don't know. I I don't really crave that too much. I, I love I love to learn. So as soon as I have like, if I'm not doing a task, then yeah, I'm like on YouTube watching educational mm -hmm. stuff. Or my new guilty pleasure is this channel, Whistlin' Diesel. You ever heard of him? Mm hmm it is the worst best thing that has ever happened to me it is basically me as a kid growing up like we used to mess around with cars and stuff like taking you know ripping the roof off of it oh, and okay jumping off ramps and stuff and uh being just jerks on motorcycles and stuff he's the one that i don't know if you saw a guy put 10 foot wheels on a model 3 recently on a tesla no and drove it upside that. down uh -uh. it's drove stuff it upside like, down drove it upside down even he like, is, like flipped it on its back like oh because it was 10 the feet wheels wheels. Were so big yeah oh, okay sorry three meter wheels um <laughs> no, back to this um yeah it's he is i think he's one of the funniest people i've ever watched mm -hmm. on youtube and even someone was like editing and stuff is hilarious he's an absolute jerk and people hate him for a lot of reasonable reasons i think he is hilarious and i actually love it and now that's what I I've been watching those lately because I've been we've been working like stupid hours lately and so whenever I'm done working I'm like I just want to watch a guy just destroy something beloved. <laughs> like he ruins so much stuff. Everything that's, that's in his hands will not make it past like two days. Like did you, I forget were you a, t a fan of Top Gear like the UK Top Gear? I never watched much of it. No. So the, one of the the most entertaining things they did is oftentimes they would you know they have some crazy competition with you know cheap cars or something and you watch them like fall apart as they put them through like crazy tests and mm -hmm. speed tests and traps and I don't you know all sorts of things like that. I feel like he took that mantra times just a thousand and he and he even references it like he there's a he, not sold in the U S there's a Toyota, Toyota Hil uh, no uh, Hilux Helix mm -hmm. and um, Hilux yeah. And it's like considered this like indestructible truck. And so he's, you know, going on the top gear didn't push this thing hard enough. And it like loads it up with like, you know, 30,000 pounds and drives it off a cliff and all this just insane stuff. And you're just like, how is this guy A, alive and B, alive and C, uh, alive? I don't know. I mean, it's just <laughs> it's insanity. OK, so so then you're going the opposite direction of me. You're going like intensity, excitement, craziness, <laughs> insanity. Right now. Right now. I think it seasons, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm just preparing for orbital and I need <laughs> high something crazier more. than that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so well, my theory, and like I said, I've talked to some other people that are like, yeah, I find myself watching road videos for hours, is is that like, how how stressful have the last like three or four years been? Yeah. Politically, pandemically, you know, just everybody's tense yeah. and everything. And I was like, of course, we're all gravitating toward escape into whether it's comfort oh. <laughs> or, or craziness. Yeah. Right. Um, I find myself watching... I, I'm a thousand times more likely to sit down and watch a movie I've already seen a million times versus yeah. watching some new movie that everybody's saying is so great because it's just like, I just want some, I just want something that makes me happy and just, you know, send some dopamine down my spine. And that's, yeah. all, I know. that's all I want right now. I, I just today was meeting with, um, there's a, like a, 
a youth art collective, like a youth art team that my friend's wife puts on. And it's become this like really amazing project in Waterloo. They have like 50 kids after school coming and doing big, like they'll do like big city projects in the town of Waterloo and like big murals and stuff. It's like really, really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're talking about like different, they want to be doing different like social things and things or like do, doing different events. And they're just kind of brainstorming and I was helping them brainstorm. And I brought up this idea that like, man, oh man, do like, I crave those kinds of social things so much now. Whereas like mm -hmm. I don't know, four or five years ago, I don't think it would have been a big deal, but then, you know, we went so to living online during the pandemic that like, that's like, that is so valuable to me. It's like these like yeah. in-person things, like again, like going to Amsterdam and, and hanging out with people physically was uh, extremely important to me. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. It's just weird. It is. It's weird. I think we're, I think we are seeing an ebb and flow and like a, a pushback against like the extreme online living and extreme, I don't know, it feels like things are begin, you know, normalizing again and people are starting to consider like, hey, let's not have children be on cell phones and on Instagram and stuff at the age of nine now. You know, I mean, like there's some some boundaries and considerations to those things where before I just don't think we were even considering it. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been trying to have people over at my house more and stuff and um doing bad movie nights, like finding really terrible old movies and just yes. sitting down and watching them. Uh, we've been going through the, the Andy Sedaris collection of like hard ticket to Hawaii and oh. Picasso trigger and all those like really I, bad B movies. Oh, that would be, I wish I lived in Dallas now because I would be joining you for those. It's did, remind me, did you, did you watch troll two ever? Oh, I've seen it. Yeah. 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 I think that's Bill bog. Yes. No bog. <laughs> You don't piss oh. on hospitality. <laughs> I won't allow it. Oh, I still remember one time uh, I was on tour with a band and we ended up, you know, we get to this place that we're crashing at like three in the morning. You know, sometimes it's just ridiculous and we're all tired and, you know, we, we're all just literally sleeping in this person's living room. Mm. And, you know, we're all like, should we put something on? Yeah, what, do, what should we watch? We're like, let's just put on Troll 2. You know, like, I don't know. Ha ha, there it is on the screen. Oh, let's watch it. Uh, we can fall asleep to that. We stayed up for the whole thing <laughs> laughing hysterically until 5 a.m. Like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> it's too entertaining. Yeah. Well, uh, Tommy Wiseau has a new movie on the way. He does? Yeah, it's called Big Shark. Oh my, I did not know this. The, my wife shared the trailer with me, but but like the, the beginning of the trailer is these two boxers kind of going at it, like sparring and stuff. And then it's suddenly about a giant shark that takes over a city. <laughs> so, no connection obviously. whatsoever, you know. You just wouldn't get it. Yeah, I wouldn't get it. <laughs> what I haven't seen is any Neil Breen stuff. I don't know if I'm familiar. Oh, okay. So there's there's a there's a channel called Your Movie Sucks or YMS, I guess. But he does this breakdown of all of Neil Breen's movies. And he's actually done a few movies since then, but they're like super low budget, awful, terrible, like to the point that you're like, does he know what he's doing? Right. Is he doing this on purpose? Or but there's 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 a lot of real weirdness around it because like if you if you want to buy his movies Again, I feel like this is done on purpose. Like in order to buy the movie, you have to go and buy a separate movie. And then in like the, the comments, like through PayPal or whatever, in the comments, you have to spe specify which movie you want. Like you got to jump through all these hoops to get it. Ugh. But like that's part of it or something, you know, that's like meta. or I don't Yeah. Know. Interesting. Yeah. Makes me wonder if there's something to that that we should all be doing. <laughs> <laughs> make it really hard for people to watch our videos make it really hard to watch our terrible videos like maybe we're on to oh, something okay make it really so, easy to see a good video make it really hard to see a bad video but what if all your videos are just sort of like base level crap <laughs> i wouldn't know which ones to select for mine i know that's hey not a self jab <laughs> no yeah. not in this house <laughs> Oh man! So you you've always been pretty nomadic. Yeah, ish. I'm gonna use nomadic and hilariously like also homebody, like extremes, like hardcore never home to please for the love of God, like I want to just be home and I'll never move from Iowa. Like I don't know what it is. You know what I mean? Because you do. Because there are some people that literally just live in Bocanow. 
Oh yeah. Other well, other people who follow Port right, Isabel, right. South yeah, Padre yeah. area, yeah. That yeah. area, yeah. Yep. But you yeah. you've always you've chosen to go back and forth. Yeah. And so you do kind mostly, of like keep your home base in Iowa. Forth. Yeah. <laughs> I and it's nothing against it's just there's something about the being down there that's really exhausting. Everything is sure. extremely far apart and mm. the wind. I was talking about this mm. the other day, like something about the wind and the air and something like I don't know how I get so tired there, like physically just exhausted. I don't know what it is. I'm, I've been happy to lucky to be, even feel like I'm getting anything done out there, but I definitely can hardly get like video work done you know i'll, I'll mm -hmm. have a video that i'm editing and i'll be doing it down there while waiting a week yeah when nothing happens and yet it just is it's just hard i don't know i'm just so far removed from my routine and even though i've got a, a nice setup down there and stuff it's just not the same and you know there's something about like just i don't know being home and home yeah, yeah home is where the heart is i guess i don't know <laughs> I have no idea i don't know what it is i don't know why well, no, I always, I mean, God, how long have we known each other now? Like five years? Something yeah, like that? I think it's like, it might have even been 2017, like end of 2017, 2018. Yeah, I think you're right. Just crazy. Yeah, because we we're all trying to, we we're all waiting for our Model 3s for a while there. Oh, yeah. We had a dude, where's my car segment on the show. Yes. Oh, my God. I think we started the show end of 2017. Yeah, I think so. We need to say that for the, for those that don't know. Joe and I and <laughs> someone used to do a, a podcast called Our Ludicrous Future together, which is why our chemistry is so natural because we spent years doing it, doing it. Wait, we spent years doing I it. I don't know how to talk to you anymore. <laughs> it's been too long. Thanks for ruining it. <laughs> Dude, that's what I do. That's our that's our stick, right? <laughs> it's true. Well, no, but like ever since I've known you, you you've gone around to these launches and stuff and, and live streamed them and whatnot. And, and, uh, the whole, like the unpredictability of it is something that I don't think I could handle. Like I, um, it's not that I'm against traveling or anything. I, I definitely spend more time here than I probably should. I'd like to get out more, but, um, like when, when you, when you go to see a launch and it winds up being delayed for weeks at a time and you just have to kind of sit there and wait it out. Um, it's something that I don't know that I could handle, but it's something that, that you've been doing for a long time. And I've always just kind of felt like you're just on the road a lot more. And I don't know if I can handle it either. I, I genuinely like, I kind of am telling myself these days and, and telling Patreon supporters and stuff that I really don't think I'm going to be doing like a, attempting to cover live launches uh, in person nearly as much. Like it going for like, there's a, a handful of launches, like the first, five or 10, you know, X number of Starship launches that I, I really want to see. I want to see the first, you know, couple the first ones that make it to orbit, uh, the first ones that come back to land. Like, I want to be there for those. Um, and I want to cover those, especially when we have the infrastructure that we have and all that stuff. Um, ironically, now, the van of all things, which was meant to make it easier and, and more like, hey, we can take all this beautiful stuff on the road is like yeah. also what wore me out of it. Like, I'm I'm done. Like, this is too much, too much work. Um, it's it's like an insane amount of logistics now and people. I mean, there's a team of like four to five that have to run it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, at, at some point it does just kind of come down to numbers. Like I, I'm losing money live streaming. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's not that I'm trying to, you know, make a huge killing and, you know, I'm going to always make all my money live stream or anything like it's it's just a matter of like obviously if i'm losing money it's not it's financially not mm. it's valid you know and yeah. you know if if there's so many other great sources now for uh live streams that are more dedicated more set up for live streams and um i always thought we we have the potential to have extremely high quality live streams that are you know on par with the launch providers um and as like as a matter of fact you have, I, been. you have been doing that yeah, I your, think your stuff of the Artemis launch was like better than what NASA had, frankly. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Thank you. I, I, I'm <laughs> really, really happy with how our, our live stream turned out there. Um, and but, you know, that didn't for sure make any money. Like mm. at the end of the day, you know, by the time I paid for everyone and all the hotels and the, uh, the time and flights and all that stuff, it just it absolutely not profitable, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I'd rather I miss the days when, you know, I 
make more content. I'm actually making a decent amount of content, believe it or not. And it feels- one came out today. Yeah, a video just came out today. I don't know after... when this podcast is going to come out. But... Right, but there's only three weeks after my last video came out. Yeah. You know? That's pretty good for me. And that included, I had to go, I was, uh... oh, I don't know if I can say this. Yeah, I can say this. Yeah, I can say this. I went to uh, my, my brother-in-law and my nephew perform, or they both are uh, contestants on American Ninja Warrior. They've done okay. it. This is their second season now, or my brother-in-law third season. So, um, yeah, I went out to that filming. Again, I just you know love going out to support the family and help out with the nephews and niece and stuff too. So it's, it's really important to me to, you know, always try to be there for those. And, yeah. um, you know, that, like that takes up time and I, it's to the point where the nomadic syndrome is thinking about like literally just trying to minimize days in the air and thinking about like the impact of, of work and life mm-hmm. as like, you know, most people, when you think of flying, it's like, whatever, but now it's like, I'm literally like trying to, I don't know, like every time I fly, I'm like, all right, what's the, the best, like absolute best flight schedule. Like, is there only like, I'm, I love risking 30 minute layovers if there's like a, you know, another flight afterwards and stuff. And it's just all about like getting there, getting there, getting the, you know, getting stuff done and keep moving. Cause it's, it just is exhausting sometimes. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm partly surprised. I'm partly not surprised to hear you say that the, the schedule is kind of um, ground you down a little bit. Cause I know it would grind me down. That, like I just said, I don't know how you've always done it, um, but but it is kind of ironic, I guess, that like you you put all this effort into that van and now suddenly it's like, I just don't want to do this. Yeah, it was, it's, yeah, if we were, it's kind of ironic because our streams, we want to make sure that we're using like the highest quality things we can. And ironically, like we wouldn't want to have any cameras that aren't good enough to like, our cameras that we put out in the field are ones that we don't want to leave out in the field. You know, they're like high quality, sure. you know, always high speed 4k, you know, often mm-hmm. between two to six grand or something, you know, for the body, um, like for expensive, the body. <laughs> yeah, for the pretty expensive cameras. And ironically, like I've always just believed like it's better just to have high quality things, um, on, on that end. And then, you know, like not worry about the, the 24 hour stuff and all that thing, but, and, and not worry. And, ironically like that also but that's also what like pays for it too you know like Mm -hmm. obviously you know nsf and lab pottery the ones that have been doing this stuff since you know kind of the last two years pretty consistently and and i mean that's what pays for all of their people and all of their encoders and all their data is like these 24-hour live streams and it's it's an amazing like i just don't have that business model where i don't Mm -hmm. want to be doing that there is already that they're doing such a great job but it's like now i've almost like shot myself in the foot a little bit because it's like I have the setup that's really expensive that's not going to net like the increase in you know like no one's paying YouTube doesn't pay me four times more for four times the pixels you know and you know super chats and things aren't going to be greatly reflected you know increase in money even though it costs 10 times more you know like it it, so it's just not it's it's an inverse relationship as far as uh uh, profit standpoint so Mm -hmm. Um, it's just not, and at the end of the day, so my, my mantra has always been like, I want to, I I'm likely going to go to these launches and I've always felt this responsibility to want to share it with people and give them that experience, especially that, like that firsthand, you know, the, I, you know, obviously I, I really think SpaceX does a great job with their launch live streams. I think NASA is doing a lot better these days. ULA has always done like a fair job. Rocket Lab does a good job. Um, you know, all, all these companies do a pretty good job, but there's a certain, sense of inauthenticity you know like a certain sense of scriptedness and oh and, totally you know, yeah, yeah non-emotion yeah. non-human aspect and that's always something that i've been excited to share is like what's it actually like when you're here in the you know in the moment listening seeing you know stressing enjoying you know all of these emotions and, and that that aspect of it is something that i've always been really excited to share and that's what that's what you know has made it why I do it for the last and, and why I include my face. I know a lot of people are like, it's about the rocket. You know, yes, it is literally about the rocket, but it's also about the human connection and helping you feel like you're here watching it with me instead of just watching the official live stream, which will be, you know, focused on the, the, the mission, which is great, you know. Yeah. But and also you are able to like respond and interact with the audience and answer questions and stuff. And, and they don't really do that on the other right. live streams or yep. for the, the official live streams, I guess. 
Right. There is an interaction that's really, really, really fun. But that also scales poorly, too. Like, the bigger the audience gets and the more questions we have, the harder it is to yeah. to interact and, and answer questions for people. And, um, yeah, it's weird. It's like there's a lot of inverse relationships in in scaling it. And I don't – and for me, like, I – I, I want to always do what I enjoy doing and like where my heart is. And when it gets to the point where it's more stress than it's, than it is fun, then I, and I don't enjoy it obviously. And yeah. I need to listen to that, you know, and I, I miss the days when I could easily put book, a, you know, work on a, a vacation or something three months in advance and not have anything else to worry about as far as like, Oh my God, what if something, something happens? During this, you know, it's like, no, that's not life anymore. I, it was ironic, you know, I used to do, I, I think we've talked, we used to talk about this on our letter Cruise future, but, you know, I used to stress out and, and hate doing weddings because I would have these dates a year in advance that were in a calendar and all of a sudden I couldn't be spontaneous, like two weeks in advance, you know, my friends might be like, hey, we're going to go up to Minneapolis and catch this concert. And I'd be like, crap, I'm, you know, all my weekends are always busy, you know, but now this is the opposite. It's like, I can be spontaneous about a day or two out maybe, but like any calendar, anything in my calendar is just an absolute nightmare, which mm -hmm. is so stupid. That's not a fun way to live. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that it kind of grounds you down after a while. Cause that's, that's rough. Um, something that I remember you always saying was that you wanted to be the Walter Cronkite of space. Yeah. Still feel that way? Yes and no. Um, yeah. I, 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 what I really, what I see, the funny thing is, ironically, I don't think I know a ton about Walter Cronkite's career other than like his, <laughs> his coverage of, of, uh, you know, the Saturn, Saturn V Pro and, and the Apollo program. Well, how I take that when you say to be the Walter Cronkite, um, or someone might also say Edward R. Murrow, but like, those were like the, the, the gold standard. Those were like the guys that everybody was like, they, they shoot down the middle. We believe what that guy has to say. Um, if you want to know something about a thing, then Walter Cronkite is the guy you listen to, right? Yeah, th that's, that's that's how I always took that. Kind of what I want. What I want, but th the big thing for me is I always just remember as a kid seeing footage that that CBS and, and that he shot, where you're hearing and seeing his reaction to these events. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was already. It's ironic. This is a stupid thing for me to say Walter Cronkite of space because he was already the Walter Cronkite of uh, at space. Like he was already Apollo. Uh, yeah, of Apollo. You know, like I, I guess it just I I that's the aspect of Walter Cronkite that I'm, and, and also, yeah, that like the high standard of, of information and, uh, and approachability. Cause you know, people would tune in because he would help explain these things, but really I think almost, uh, you know, I don't like Mythbusters almost or something like that, you know, where, well, I, they didn't always, they were always a little bit more entertaining leaning than, um, than hard factual, but I appreciated a little bit of that scientific method aspects. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just always want to to make video like make stuff that I would want to watch and that I would learn from. And that it's mm -hmm. kind of just that simple. A lot of the videos that I do, it's like I I find myself interested in a subject and it's like I want to learn about this and the video is the excuse to learn about it. Yeah. You know, it's it's like it it almost sort of gamifies the learning of it. It's like, well, now I got now I got to now I got to look this up. I guess I have to look it I'm going to make a video yeah. about it. I, I need to learn this, you know, yep. um, otherwise I just kind of like it'd be off in the distance somewhere. So it's exactly, I, it, um, I don't mean to speak for you, but I, for me anyway, like when I'm, that's, that's my favorite part of doing this mm -hmm. is like finding some rabbit hole that's just like, wow, this is actually fascinating. I want to know more. Yes. And then I get to like make a video and share that with people, you know, 100%. now a lot of my videos are also just like, I need to put something out this week. So <laughs> here's, here's, you know, five, ducks that save the world or something you know but uh how <laughs> oh, these five ducks reprogrammed the infrastructure of uh yeah bank network banking and or or today it's just chat gpt what is a viral video idea <laughs> thank you <laughs> um but but i mean like w when you talk about like um sorry i'm kind of just stumped myself but i, I think that that's similar to what you're talking about here it's like you you have these like passions for rocketry and stuff and it's like I get to learn about this stuff and I get to share it with people. hundred percent. Yeah. And, and, and for a long time, I think maybe the live streaming was a big part of that. And now it's, you're getting more into the more educational, take your time and really create an encyclopedia of a certain type of rocket kind of thing. Yeah. I, th I think that's pretty, a pretty fair characteristic. And, 
And frankly, I think it's it literally just comes down to I love I I know I'm doing a good job when I'm learning something. When I'm putting out a video and there's stuff that I didn't know, and I'm like really excited about it, kind of like you know mm -hmm. exactly what you were saying. Um, and I know that there's some like you know I don't know if when you're making a video you see in your head already what's going to be on screen. You you see how like oh that that does this or that you know like I a lot of it's like literally mechanical things that I'm thinking about of like. Oh, that valve connects to this, and that's why it goes this. When does it? I need to. We need to be drawing that out. Why aren't there? And I'm looking for like you know googling. I'm like these are horrible diagrams. <laughs> yeah. Why is it so complicated? Let's at least simplify it. You know, like I'm excited about like how it's going to look to the viewer and and how we can. You know, I don't know. It's amazing that and the fact that there's incredible three D artists and stuff too. Like I work a lot with Casper Stanley, who is a three mm -hmm. uh, D artist, and just you know, being able, being able to tell them like, Hey, whip this up. Quick. Okay. Brrrp. And it's like, yeah, here it is a fresh awesome. brand new 4k render that the world has never seen. That would have taken Hollywood like six years to make, you know, just 20 years ago or something. Mm. It's like it's there and it's incredible. And you're flying through the engine and the valves and <laughs> it's just amazing. So it is fun just to, to think about like, you know, I am just such a, I just like having a visual match what's in my head and what the dialogue is. You know, I, when I'm writing, that's all I'm thinking about. And I, I just absolutely love that. Uh, yeah. That, that we can like live up to that now, you know, mm -hmm. in, in a, like on a shoestring budget compared to what, you know, discovery channel or something used to be doing back in the day. You know, I feel like that used to be like, I actually realized I threw a little shade at, at Nat Geo. I didn't realize how much amazing programming they're still doing. I just know that like the network Nat, national geographic or Nat Geo and discovery and science and, History mm -hmm. Channel all fell, succumbed to so the, hard. Yeah. the reality TV garbage and lost. But growing up, like, that's the stuff. That's how I learned was these, you know, well-produced things. And I don't know. Now it's like, let's do that on our own now, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you can get hyper-specific on it on, on YouTube, you know? Yeah. Extreme. Like whole video on Russian rockets. Exactly. Extremely so specific. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I don't you're... love that. Your story is always, I, 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 I used to say, I'll, I'll still say it. You're the biggest nerd I know because, <laughs> but in a good way, in, in the sense of like, you found something that you love and you just went like 5,000% in on it, you know, <laughs> and, and you, you started off doing, you know, music and photography and everything. And then like, you just, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like you, you weren't like into rockets as a kid or anything. You just kind of like discovered it later and was like, this is amazing. And just like, and now you can talk with with incredible specificity and, and expertise on on different types of rocket engines and fuel mixtures and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I've just that never is, seen anybody nerd so hard on something. <laughs> well, thank you. I do take that as a as a high compliment. You should. Uh, yeah, I I grew like when I was. I remember very specifically when I was about five almost five or just turned five or something. Uh, we went to the Kennedy Space Center as a kid. Um, I, at the time, was really into tractors um, and uh, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. Sure. So I remember uh, in Florida, you know, at Disney, I got a Chip and Dale uh, little, little uh, dolls or whatever, toys, plush toys, whatever they are, I don't mm -hmm. know. And that was my highlight. Uh, I, I remember the Space Center. Ironically, we saw the space shuttle, uh, I, I believe it was Columbia, um out there with um was it columbia or challenger no yeah, challenger blew up already by then um mm -hmm. it was columbia with i believe with uh with hubble inside it so it was sitting on the on the pad and oh, wow. the tour went around so i you know i looked through a photo album when i'm like realizing that i love space you know this is just a few years ago i was like i'm like yeah remember when we went there i'm like i, I have vague memories of kennedy space center as a kid and i'm like and i remember seeing a space shuttle and, and we saw it launch from the you know like we were back at the hotel and I'm like, I barely remember that. I wonder what launch that is. And I look it up. I'm like, that was Hubble. How crazy Holy is that? Crap. Wow. You know, but but like at the time, you know, and I did have like a, you know, I had space shuttle like uh, bed sheets and like a, a poster on the wall. But really it was like tractors, cars, airplanes, like were the big thing. And and space was just sort of like neat. It was just along that lines of like machines, you know, and, mm. and things that go fast and do cool things. But it wasn't like my, I couldn't have told you what a Saturn V or a space shuttle was until, you know, hardly. I, now I could have probably always said Saturn V or space shuttle. That's, but that's about it. That's the, that's that would be the end of the, under the knowledge until about seven or eight years ago. Yeah. yeah. 
I'm the opposite. I, I grew up, I, I wanted to be an astronaut more than anything. And some teacher, while trying to encourage me to study math harder, said, you know, if you want to be an astronaut, you got to be really good at math. And I was always terrible at math. And I was like, well, I'm never going to be an astronaut. And that killed my dreams right there. That's sad. But she was trying to be encouraging, but yeah. like it, it totally like just wow. floored me. I was like, well, okay, I guess I'll make movies or something. I don't know. <laughs> That's easier. Who's laughing now, lady? Wait, <laughs> guy. On lady YouTube. tried to encourage and foster me. Who's laughing now? Yeah, that, that's what you get for trying to support children. Um, <laughs> but no, I had uh, I had the space shuttle models, and I had I, th I think I had a Saturn V model. Uh, I had the poster on the wall and all that, you know. Um, and then I got older and kind of grew out of it. But uh... it was definitely like a part. Like when we were kids, I mean, that was especially like early you know you were, were we're born around the same time and the space shuttle was like this new era so it was very common and exciting and it was a, a big thing just to you know space shuttle stuff it's mm -hmm. just what we were doing now like it's cool you know mm -hmm. kind of like concord it's like the concord the space shuttle and you know uh 1969 stingrays i don't know you know like, <laughs> that's what's cool but, yeah yeah I don't know. You know I watched the other day while I was reworking. I, again, I'm, I, I find myself going back and watching movies that I, I've known for years or whatever. Yeah. I watched Flight of the Navigator. Oh, yeah. I watched that like probably three years ago for the first okay, time. Okay, so you've seen it fairly recently. Fairly recently. Um, The first half of that movie slaps. Yes. Like it really holds up really well. Yes. Until he gets into the machine yes. and it scans his brain. And then suddenly the machine turns into Pee Wee Herman. Yes. And everything gets like weird and goofy after that. Yes. All of a sudden there's all these dumb puppets and stuff. You're like, how would you 85? Why did you 80s this or 90s or whatever it was? Like, <laughs> no, it was 80s. It was did. definitely 80s. Of course you did. Like, yeah. you had this really cool premise leading up to that. And, oh, the first half of it was amazing. Like, the kid goes into the woods and then he wakes up and it's years later and he's like crying in the stairwell. Where are my mom and dad? And like, kid's great, by the way. Like, I'm like really feeling it. And, th and then he gets in the machine and it's so cool. They did a great job on the design of this yep. like spacecraft and everything. And, and when it like takes off out of the thing and then, and then, yeah, it, like, so, like, like the machine at first it's like, Oh, you are you know, do, 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 talking like this robot. And then it scans his brain. And for some reason now he's like, ha ha, ha Pee Wee Herman, ha, you know, yeah. and it's just like, what the hell yeah. just happened to this? You're so right. What happened yeah. here? But, but the thing that, no, no, they... sorry, go ahead. Maybe they had two writers. They're like, this person yeah. wrote this half. The other person's like, "All right, we're busy. You write the part when he gets in the ship." <laughs> Maybe there was a writer strike halfway through writing it, so some scab came on and finished the end of it or something. And then Pee Wee Herman, like, <laughs> yeah, Paul Rubens is over there on the script, just right. <laughs> but um, the other thing that struck me about it when you were talking about like NASA in the '80s and everything was um, they're like sort of the bad guys in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. Howard Hessman or whatever his name is, like plays the 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 guy and they're like holding him against his will and they're gonna like pick his brain apart or whatever, you know. And and yep. it's like and there was something else, I can't remember what it was now, but I saw something else recently that was like set in the eighties and NASA was like this government, this big government agency with all this power and strength and everything. And I was like, Man, it doesn't feel like that anymore. Uh uh. And maybe you know? maybe that's what helped fuel all of the like conspiracy theory stuff too. Like I wonder if that bled through at all. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to put people myself... growing up with NASA as the bad guys and now is in yeah. politics and growing up and they're like, yeah, evil government NASA stuff, you know, we don't trust them. What are they hiding from us? Yeah. Well, there's still those people, obviously. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's yeah. where they went. Yeah. And uh, our generation. Well, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of, you know, early to mid 80s. I mean, it was only 10 years previous that we were on the moon. And now we've got this cool space plane that's, you know, flying what every three, four months or whatever, you know, like they were right. taking regular trips up there. And, and, uh, it's funny because I know NASA's budget wasn't remotely in the 80s what it was in the 60s, but it feels like culturally they had like still a, a big sway on, on the public, yeah. you know, and, and, yeah. and then it kind of seems to have drifted away a little bit. Definitely. Well, I really think it all comes down to the, <sighs> It all, you know what? I think the number one thing that it came down to is that the space shuttle had the stupidest uh, constraint 
that it had to potentially launch a satellite in a single orbit and come back and land at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Mm. And it also had to do the same to retrieve his satellite from Vandenberg Space Force Base. An absolutely insane request. Like, mm. imagine, okay, the payload bay doors take however long to open. An EVA uh -huh. suit takes however long to put on to change the pressure and do all this stuff. Imagine a launch, an orbit is only 90 minutes. Rendezvousing and docking can be four hours. Mm -hmm. Like, how are you going to rendezvous with a foreign satellite, open up the payload bay doors, have someone out there EVAing, securing this thing where you don't know where the bolts are? You're going to have to just strap it in randomly? Like, and what? To, You're out there with a lasso. Just... Like, literally, that's what I it was the stupidest thing. And the whole shuttle, the whole reason it's the shape it is and why it's like big solid rocket boosters and all the every aspect of it was around that constraint mm -hmm. and that constraint killed it because it was completely far-fetched it never could have lived up to its possibilities of that let alone like all of those things made it completely inherently flawed to ever be the system that it was hoping to be yeah. and it wasn't nasa and the engineers faults i think if they had the budget they did and if it actually if it had just slightly had a little bit higher budget to be able to do like a fully reusable you know rocket powered jet for you know for the first stage and mm. all that stuff and and could have evolved a little bit i mean i think we would be in a totally different world yeah yeah i think um to counter my own point a second ago probably part of the reason why nasa's influence might have waned a little bit is the fact that we did lose two shuttles mm -hmm. and a bunch of astronauts um yeah and for 11 years or so there they didn't yeah. have it. can i can i share sorry totally random can i share something that pissed off the nerd in me so much Ooh, yeah yeah you, you would have loved this okay so you know the comedian john mulaney right yeah yeah okay so big fan i think he's hilarious yeah. he came through dallas a buddy of mine got tickets and we got to go see him so that was cool and so we're, we're sitting there watching it and he's doing this whole show it's all nice and funny and stuff he had been back from drug rehab so there was a lot of comedy stuff around that he goes into this thing about the russian space program and he, I'm paraphrasing, but he literally started it off by saying, the Russians put a dog in space and then never did anything else. And then had this whole comedy bit about how all Russia ever did was put a dog into space. And I'm just sitting there seething. I'm like, what the F are you talking about? Dude, what are you talking about? Like they were the only ride to the space station for like 11 years. Yeah, and they were the first on everything but actually landing on the moon. They kind of rather famously got the first man in space. Yes. Rather famously, you and know, the, and it's the just first like. Woman, and then the first orbit, the first run, even the all first thing. Yay, the first like everything. What? They killed the entire rest of the show for me because I'm just sitting there like. Dude, have you opened this... a history book? Exactly, but I'm like, there, there's probably hundreds of people in here that don't know any better, right? And walked away thinking that. How? And just as somebody who is just so like so sad. triggered by misinformation now, it's just like, what are you doing? That's anyway. I, I thought that would trigger yeah, you too. That one is really, especially literally considering up until 2020. Yeah, like you said, we were relying on the Russians to do anything human spaceflight related. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I just, I'm sorry. I just had to get that out. <laughs> it just reminded me of that. And I was just like, ah, it's insanity. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that really grinds my gears. That grinds my gears. <laughs> Wait, was that supposed to be Peter Griffin? That was a terrible Peter Griffin. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I won't even try. I'll save, I'll save everyone. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's about as far as it goes. Yeah. That's, that's better than anything I would do. For sure. <laughs> You know, I was actually um, talking about the Russian stuff. So you covered all the engines and whatnot. Uh, have I referenced before in this podcast that you did a Russian? <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm like, <laughs> um, yeah. So I have a video coming out Monday, actually. Uh, this the next family, entire family tree of Soviet rocket engines. <laughs> I don't know where this idea just came to me. I don't know. <laughs> um, but no, so so like we had the space shuttle, and then they had the Bur Buran. Yep. Am I yeah, saying that Buran. right? Yeah. Not Buran, Buran, it's Buran. Yeah, exactly. Okay, all right. Um, which was basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe even a little better, right? Yeah. 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 Except it never flew, so that's kind of a bummer. It did fly um, once. Right. 
and flew once. Into space? Oh yeah. Oh, really? Uncrewed. Uncrewed. Yep. Oh, I thought they just did like a like a test like landing or something. No, they had a hand. They had a, a glider test vehicle, kind of like we have Enterprise. The Enterprise, yeah. And they had one that fully fully flew into orbit, came back all uncrewed, completely autonomous. I didn't know that. That's right, because the shuttle wasn't autonomous. Right. Yeah. Fully autonomous, yeah. and it was perfect. I mean, some tiles fell off. Like, I mean, NASA's yeah. familiar with that, but in space. Well, where I was going with that was like we we had the shuttle, they had the Buran. Kind of, if you want to call it a copy, whatever. Um, the the video that I've got coming out on Monday is about um, nuclear thermal propulsion, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a new engine that NASA and DARPA have teamed up on. It's called Draco. Oh. Yeah. Um, but they had Nerva back in the day, and apparently the Soviets had their own version of that going, and they canceled it as soon as Nerva got canceled. So the that RD was like zero four ten was it or eight RD eight something. Oh, I don't yeah. even have the I don't have the name in front of me. But. Yeah, it was better. It was small enough to, be able to launch be launched on a proton. Oh, As yeah. opposed to the Nerva, the only vehicle could, that put could put Nerva and the stage into orbit was a Saturn V. Mm. It was huge. But the Soviet one still it couldn't launch from the ground. It was like only in Correct. space, right? Yeah. Correct. They have very poor thrust weight ratio. Yeah. And you would irradiate everything like exhaust wise. So you don't want um, yeah, okay. you don't want to spew radioactive hydrogen all over uh, your launch infrastructure, probably. I mean, maybe does maybe, it irradiate maybe, the hydrogen? Probably, it goes right through the core of a reactor and then. Oh, shoots I thought it just kind of heated it. I didn't know it would actually pass through the actual. I don't know. I I, I always assumed it did. I guess I that's one of those topics that it's a future topic for me too. Like I I always assumed that you can't f get heated through the core without. How do they do that with the pools, you know, like for a nuclear power plant or something? Because I know that they make it so the water, the <laughs> actively cooled water Man, things doesn't that get I irradiated. Know. Oh, if I remember it, hold on. I think they have kind of a two-stage a two -stage thing where, like, there's a pool of water that is extremely radioactive, and it goes basically through a radiator. You know what I mean? Like, it goes to a separate, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. uh, bypass, you know, a thing that just has, like, a literally a radiator. Mm -hmm. And then another channel of fresh water flows through it. And so that won't pick up the radiation because it's, it won't. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why I don't, I try not to get too technical in my videos. So it's like, I'll talk about a, a nuclear engine, but I'll talk about like why it's important and what it can do and what right. it would open up and all that. But I wouldn't get into the details of it because I know I would get something wrong. Yep, exactly. Um, I'm trying to remember. I, I'm now looking up the so I'm blanking on the name of the and I already have like half of a script written about it even. Oh really? Soviet uh, nuclear rocket engine. I am, and it's in my video even. Oh, this is zero four ten. I said that right away. Dang okay. it! You just stuck with my. Uh, Trust yourself. Trust that gut instinct. I really, really should have. Dang it! Well. Well, yeah. where I was going with that was. Um, <laughs> It would be neat to do a video that looks at like all the sort of and I hate to use the word copycat, but like this parallel parallel design. How about that mm -hmm. between the United States and the Soviet Union? Yeah, yeah. Well, or there Russia, was like I guess. a lot of influence back and forth on. Mm -hmm. It's you know it was, it, was, it was an arms race. It was a it like stemmed from the nuclear arms race. You know the whole reason we had rocket technology was literally to deliver nukes originally like that's why rockets exist is it was a yeah, yeah. It was literally like how do we get a nuclear weapon to our enemy fast and with you know without being shot down like you know originally obviously we flew planes and you know jets and planes literally planes and mm -hmm. you know and dropped the nuke out the out the bay and that could have been shot down it could have been blah 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 you know i mean it's and then the the you know the Nazis came up with hey we'll use this stupid little gimmicky rocket technology that was always considered almost more of a party trick than uh, than anything else and they made it reliable enough to be able to occasionally deliver you know weapons to uh, a nearby area you know it's like and then it all just stemmed from there it became like well what if we could hit someone across the world what if we could you know, do all this stuff. And eventually it's like, well, we could probably even use this to put a human on top. That'll show them. I was going to say, they could even send something more dangerous than a nuclear weapon. A person. <laughs> a human 
uh, MacGyver with a ballpoint <laughs> pen and a, and a screwdriver. That's that's what all of our ICBMs just had Chuck Norris on the top of it, <laughs> sending it over. And a uh, and a not a wombat. What's that? Um, a honey badger. Honey badger. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where do those live? Uh, They're in Africa, aren't they? I don't know where honey badgers live. I gotta look this that's up. That's what they would launch. Yep, um, honey badger. They live in. Oh, come on, kingdom animals. Where do honey badgers? This is the dumbest. Where come on, Chad GBT. Honey badgers live. Okay, you're right. Africa and Asia, from mm. southern Morocco to Africa's southern tip, and Western Asia's Caspian Sea, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Nepal. I didn't know that. I kind of thought they were. They kind of look like something we might see around here. They kind of look like a skunk almost. You know, I always mm -hmm. assumed that they're in running around down near you and in Mexico some, or something. Some wolverines. And maybe Australia. I feel like that's an Australian type of animal. Just and gives no Fs and uh, exactly. wants to one kill you. One of my favorite Formula One drivers, uh, Daniel Ricciardo, they call him the honey badger. And, uh, and he's from Australia, so I kind of assumed, honestly. Uh, that, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, see, I, I would make that connection, too. Have you gotten into Formula One yet? No, I want to hear you talk about it. Because you talked about cars and tractors and stuff and how much you're into it. And it's it's never been a thing that I've personally gotten into. Sell me on it, Tim. Okay. Oh, this is Here my we go. Let's thing. do it. Allie, Allie hates this because I do this about every time I meet or catch up with someone. I'm like, are you into Formula One yet? Okay, I have to admit. I'm Yeah, because you will be. Yeah, you will be. I'm, I'm fair weather guy because I fell in love with it just because of the Netflix show Drive to Survive. That got me into it. But it okay. got me very like instantly because here's the deal internationally speaking most people grow up with their you know families watching and loving formula one right like that's that's us with you know football and baseball in the united states you know there's always most people grow up with that obviously in europe and most of the rest of the world it's formula one and soccer and football just, you know so we don't care we don't have that culture we don't follow this stuff so we don't we need to be spoon-fed and that's exactly what Drive to Survive on Netflix did. It okay. spoon-fed me these personalities and a little bit of the drama, but what I fell in love with that I didn't know, because I always kind of conflated it with all other sports and stuff, there's only 20 drivers. So you only have to keep track of 20 people all year. And it's a long okay. season. It's like nine months long. So all you have to do is keep track of these 20 people and 10 teams. So there's two drivers per team. So what's fun about it is your teammates, but you're also like, you're still competing. You know, you're still... There's, oh, there's okay. two championships. There's a driver championship and there's the constructor, like the team championships. So there's a lot of inter, interplay drama where it's like you're friends with the person in the opposite car, but they're also your biggest enemy because they're the only other person you compare apples to apples because it's an identical car as mm -hmm. opposed to the other guy on the other team. That car, you know, they might be fast, but it might, is that the driver or is it the car, you know? And okay. so your teammate is the one that's like your ultimate enemy in a way, but it's also like we have to work together and then it's cool because it's almost like the Olympics. It goes all around the world. You know, it's a, it's, it's a very international thing. You have drivers and teams from, from all these different, you know, it's very prestigious, but then they, a lot of them are street circuits. So like they'll, you know, block off the roads in Monaco yeah. and race in the streets of Monaco. And it's just incredible. And, and it's people so are like fun. standing right there next to it. Right there. Insane. And they're going, I mean, not on that track, but they're going maybe close to it, 200 miles an hour. I mean, they're flying, pulling yeah. six, seven G's in the corners. And it's just unbelievable. And, and it's just, it's just really fun to, to have kind of, I've never been a sports guy. I've never cared about sports. So I, I am feeling like I love the kind of having some people to cheer for and watching the race. The races are only typically about 90 minutes or so. So not like huge all day things. Like I feel like I, I conflated a lot of formula one, I think with like NASCAR where there can be horribly long. There's hundreds of people you have to think about and like, yeah. I'm just, and it's just turning left, you know, like, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is about the opposite of that and it's just it's fascinating and i and it's become now my favorite uh leisurely pastime thing and i'm waking up at all times to watch a, every race live well how often do they race there's 20 some races a year and the season officially oh, that's like almost every other week yeah so right now we're in a dry spell they just raced last sunday had the most red flags ever in a formula one race it was a crazy race and right now like it's fun for me because i'm again new to this there's a red bull racing is like totally dominant and they have max verstappen who's like this in i mean he is arguably by far just he's an incredible driver he's also in easily the fastest car so they're just totally and he's i think he's a jerk so it's really fun <laughs> to cheer against him you know like he's the heel I, 
He's the heel, and I love that. I love a good heel. Um, but yeah, so now we have to wait like three or four more weeks until the next race, which is is rough. Hmm. It'll give me time to focus on Starship again, just like I always am. Uh, as, as soon as they finally set a launch date, that's when the next race is going to be. <laughs> like at the T zero, like well, let's line it. What if we lined it up with that with that race? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so okay, uh, total noob. I don't know anything about this, but like so. It, are the teams like constructing the cars and making them go faster and giving them more like are, are all the cars all like standardized all the same and it's all about the drivers or is it the team oh, okay indycar is standard like IndyCar literally is, okay. they have the same physical car and there's very you know there's tuning and things they can do to it like set up with the suspension but with formula one each team is in charge of constructing you know a lot of them aren't like literally like you know they're buying parts from other sources and stuff, but they are engineering the car, you know, from mm. and within certain constraints. Like each car has to follow a set of rules of the diameter of the spoiler cannot exceed a certain radius of blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's crazy, like, rule book that has to be applied, which is insane. Okay. And they constantly are changing and evolving it. So the cars have to continually change and evolve to the rules. Uh -huh. And then they, they weigh it out too. like the the cars are almost entirely a work of art of aerodynamics, like almost through and through it's all about like how does this car handle aerodynamics like how does the front spoiler affect the the side pods affect the the rear tires and the under spoiler and all the the floor and all this stuff it's just absolutely crazy so what they do is they penalize the top drivers whoever like the team that wins will have the least amount of wind tunnel testing time oh. and then the team that's the the worst teams actually get the most wind so it tries to they try to make a really even field out there so it, it is frustrating when it's a really dominant team that's you know absolutely destroying everyone and everyone else looks like they're standing still um they try to make it so there isn't a runaway like that and it used to be like if you win you made the most money therefore you can put the most money in development for the next car and mm -hmm. it would you know get away from you and they're trying to you know put budgets on things and budget caps and all this stuff and certain constraints they're trying to keep it interesting and i, I love it i don't know i don't know why yeah, that's great. I, I've wanted to love racing because I've been a car guy my whole life and a motorcycle guy. I just never cared. I never care. Like, you can't get me to care about someone else doing something. I want to do that, you know? Uh, and have now, you been to any of these races? Any of the F1 races? Went to Austin last year. Yeah. Oh, okay. It was fun. It was fun, but it, there's also 440,000 people that pff, yeah. you know, are in one yeah. spot at one time. And if you left at the wrong time, you'd get stuck for three hours kind of thing. Well, but that's what Austin's like all the time. So <laughs> yeah, I would, that's just all day on 35. That's yeah, that's, that's great. That's Tuesday on 35. <laughs> exactly. Like it's um, yeah, it, it was fun, but honestly, it's not the best way to actually watch a race. Yeah. Like, you know, hearing the commentary and seeing the times of all the drivers, if you're sitting in the wrong place, you have no idea what's going on. You just hear yeah. like, oh, I think, oh, I think they're in front now. Oh, you know, <laughs> still a really cool experience. Would love to go to another one. But they're expensive, and frankly, if you're not probably in a place where you like have a TV, you know, like if you're like not in like some crazy ten thousand dollars suite, it's probably mm -hmm. not going to be a, a better experience than just watching from home. Maybe that could be a bucket list: is to like go to one in Monaco and be in like a really shishi yes. million dollar suite with you know Seriously. Richard Branson like <laughs> yeah. serving you champagne or something. <laughs> oh, speaking of, are we doing? I saw. Something? No, if you, yeah, you want to talk? I know, I know where I know where you're going with it because I saw it just like not, like just before we hopped on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Virgin Orbit is not doing so well. I mean, they filed for bankruptcy, right? Yeah, I would. Yeah, they did, and that would be not doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> you were being very non-specific about it. Yeah. Like... Well, they had a they had a failure about a month ago now, two months ago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and. I obviously I feel horrible because I, I have friends that work at Virgin Orbit and mm. I, I always thought what they're doing was really cool and unique, but it's at the end of the day, like, unfortunately it all does come down to like, is this profitable? Kind of like the live stream thing, you know, like sure, yeah. no one is owed like everything, like everything, uh, you know, if, if it, if it financially and doesn't have a business case to work out, then no one's owed yeah. this opportunity to be a launch, launch provider, sadly, which is, Really, I thought it was a really cool idea, but the more, the more, okay, this, I actually started writing a script, you know, how we we're talking about scripts. I'm in the middle of like four of them. Um, and one of them is about like, it's actually, it's, it's going to be, why don't they just, 
And it'll be answering that question of like launch from the equator, launch from mountains, launch from jets, launch from the catapults, because they're all kind of related to the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's a video that I'm working on. So I was writing and really thinking about like, why aren't they doing air launch more? You know, why aren't they yeah, utilizing yeah. the air to their advantage between like lift, free, free lift mm -hmm. and free oxygen? Like right there like it seems like a total no-brainer use the use the atmosphere to your advantage and at least some free velocity and free yeah all this to provide free velocity and altitude like seems like a total no-brainer but then you do actually start to do the trade of like first off in a sense like at the root of it you're fl instead of flying the payload to the rocket because that is a selling point it's like hey we can come to you and we can fly from your mm -hmm. from england mm -hmm. why would you fly the whole launch pad and the rocket to the tiny little payload on top instead of flying the tiny little payload to the rocket and the dedicated launch team you know what i mean like the whole wait, wait, launch... wait break that down i'm a little i'm a little lost there essentially what you're doing is you're flying the rocket and the launch pad literally the entire launch infrastructure to the customer like imagine if we're talking about... wait sorry 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 wait 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 so <laughs> we're talking about virgin orbit and they have the it goes up on a plane and yes. then it breaks like a missile and goes up in yes, space. Yes, exactly. So, so you're saying the way they do it is they they send the plane to the, the payload. Yes. So you're calling the plane the the launch pad, basically. Yes, it essentially okay, is. Okay. All right. Okay. They even have you know they even have to bring liquid oxygen and liquid you know mm. kerosene tanks with them. All of the infrastructure that would be a launch infrastructure for the rocket yeah. has to go to the customer, fly there. And have the whole team to operate the rocket and the the things staying there and and living there of all this around this mission okay instead of like the opposite which is the tiny little payload on top just send that to the launch pad you know like right inherently right there you kind of have the wrong side of the equation like you're you know what i mean i actually didn't know that they were doing it that way i just assumed that they had their own like bespoke place to maybe not bespoke but their one their own like permanent place to launch from or to take off from no they're the idea with them is and it's kind of this is like a common theme like astro makes a big deal out of being able to be launched from a shipping container anywhere it's like your destination oh, yeah, is yeah. space and and or like orbits like why are yeah. you why, like why are you who cares where it originates from like that's the last of most people's concerns you know like mm -hmm. especially like in the small sat launch industry you're talking about a cube sat like that could be flown on a and a carry on for somebody on an economy to could, the launch pad. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I could kind of see it as an advantage if there's like certain orbits that aren't reachable by certain, you know, um, by traditional launch right. facilities or something. Yep. But, but then how you often go, is that? But I was going to say, like, literally, uh, and I'm doing this math, like to literally mm -hmm. figure out exactly how much bigger, like pretend you just built a rocket that is Astro size and you're just trying to do 50 kilograms or whatever versus how much bigger of a rocket would you just have to fly to, to fly that mission from Kennedy Space Center, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and there is an answer there. Like there's a, it might be a much bigger rocket, but isn't it, might, may it be cheaper to fly this much larger, like Falcon 1 sized rocket versus an Astro rocket than to have this collapsible infrastructure that might cost, you know, millions of dollars to, to fly to a site and prepare and do all this stuff every time you want to launch. You know, I, I would like, <laughs> I, I'm not saying that I'm uh, right now, I'm straight up not saying that whoever thought of this is wrong because there, there had to have been trade studies that do sway that way. That has to, obviously they had to have done that. And I'm, what I'm actually saying is like, I would love to see those trades. I would love to know how does that actually make sense? Cause it inherently to me feels very backwards. It feels like weighted completely on the wrong side yeah i see where you're coming from but I, think, hmm. I see it from the other side too though because i mean like we we fly planes everywhere all the time like how could that be that much more difficult and would you need to fly like a whole team of people i mean this is me and my ignorant head like would you need to fly a whole team of people to watch an airplane take off i mean you could control it all from a ground station anywhere right i mean well they have the they have things like the the actual integration of the payload so they literally have like a mobile payload integration facility that like goes over the front of the rocket they mm. encapsulate it there on site like on site at the cusp excuse me so like specifically with england you know when they launched from from the uk um yeah they they literally drove the the you know flew 
the 747 out there, it's full of a lot of stuff. They also have a handful of like a team of people that have to like integrate the rocket and prepare and fuel up the rocket. Yeah. It's, I mean, I'm sure it's in the dozen or two dozen or three hmm. dozen. Okay. You know, it's, it's likely it's, you know, I look at it as, if you're, you know, you're, you're dedicated launch team like that. Well, I mean, also the customers all the time do fly their team to the launch site to watch the launch. Mm -hmm. They fly them to mission control at, you know, New Zealand or where, you know, Hawthorne to watch the launch and, and provide support on, you know, on site there. Um, so it's not like people aren't flying teams around already, yeah. but it just seems like it's, it just to me feels backwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's and, well, and clearly and something the, didn't work out because well, and then the other thing is it scales very poorly so you know there's a hard limit on how big of a rocket they can fly with the one of the biggest planes period which is you know 747 which they got cheap already at, you know from virgin atlantic you know owned you know so they kind of got every, they had a head start with this like here's the biggest plane we can fly they built basically the biggest most powerful rocket the, the best rocket they could you know maybe they could make tweaks to it and get a little bit more performance but at the end of the day they're not putting much more into space than an electron, sure, you know, yeah. which is very small. So now imagine you want to start doing medium class 2000, you know, kilograms, like you want to get into that medium class launch. You're, you're talking about to, to fly a plane big enough to now launch a rocket. That's eight times heavier. You're building the world's biggest airplane by eight times, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> we already did that strata launch already built that huge behemoth, you know, yeah. dual fuselage vehicle. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it could only it couldn't even lift a you know anywhere near a Falcon Nine class rocket. Yeah, yeah. it's still stuck at like a they were going to call it the Falcon Five, and I don't even think it could do that. Um, it probably would be more like a Falcon One sized rocket, you know. Yeah, it's like so it has hmm. a pretty hard limit, and then you have all those operation costs of flying and operating that aircraft. A seven forty seven yeah. at least has a, a big fleet of pilots that that are probably still certified, you know, there's a big fleet of mechanics that have worked There's a big fleet of parts and service and support for a 747. Now you're making a bespoke one of one giant, mm -hmm. you know, vehicle that, yeah, like maintenance and all of these things are going to be an absolute nightmare. Fuel. Fuel. Yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. think that we're, I mean, cause there's so many launch providers that are, that are kind of coming online right now, which is great, but do you think that we're going to have be oversaturated? Yes. Period. Like period. Yeah. I am very worried. If you haven't flown by now and mm. made it into orbit and you're not doing something incredibly unique, I'm it's getting close to where it's like, I don't know what you could do to break into the market to make it so you're you're the one that one of the ones that makes it through, you know? Like yeah. just look at Rocket Lab. They're an incredible company that has a growth path that has experience a, a great record um that is actually flying quite frequently and, and increasing their pace they're obviously still going to be behind falcon 9 and spacex but you know they're they're launching pretty darn quickly and they're and they're developing the neutron as fast as anyone probably can you know mm -hmm. and then you look at like where they're going to be in five years and these companies that haven't flown yet like you know um there's, there's going to be a handful. I don't want to name names. There's going to be a handful that do make it through just because I think there is a, a huge demand for, for payloads and unique services. But yeah, like I think Stoke, because they're so awesome and the, and the concept is, is brilliant, mm -hmm. fully reusable, even at a medium class scale, light, you know, low, low, medium class. I think, you know, I think they can make it. I really do, um, but they're doing something like so Very awful different. and unique yeah, yeah, yeah. that I think they deserve to make it. Yeah. Whereas, you know, other companies are like, yeah, we're we're working on providing, um, you know, ride share option. You know, what, instead of ride share options, we're giving you a dedicated ride to space. It's like there's already nine small sat companies doing exactly that right now. Like, what are you doing different? We'll come to you. Okay, does that make it cheaper? Nope, it's actually more expensive. But <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. I'm just not <laughs> sold. On, I a hand, like I said, I think a handful will make it through, and in 20, 30 years, we'll have a handful. I think we'll see a lot of mergers, you know, a ton of mergers. Yeah, I, think, yeah. I think the big thing, in my opinion, will be more traditional companies acquiring some of these new companies, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think someday like, Disney's going to have a rocket company. <laughs> I, mean, I think more like, you know, North of Grumman is already buddying buddy buddy with Firefly. Oh, yeah. And you know, Firefly is going to be making the first stage of the the new first stage of the Antares rocket. 
I see that probably furthering and, you know, that's Northrop Grumman's way of staying competitive in this commercial market is acquiring a plucky and, you know, nimble, uh, you know, Firefly company that has all this new technology. And, you know, I, mm-hmm. I think that's, I think we'll see that. Like, I think I could see Lockheed acquiring somebody and I can see, um, you know, ULA, I'm, I've kept hearing rumors that they might get acquired. Um, was it? I'm pretty sure the rumors were that they're getting might be get acquired by Blue Origin, which would. How does that work? Blue's already making them their engines. Yola is actually building rockets that are ready to fly in May. You know, I mean, it's it it give Blue Origin a vehicle. Now. You know how how does the company who is not putting anything into space have more like, money than the company that is putting things in? You know space? the you know the answer. The funding every, comes from the every time I order on, something from Amazon. That's how. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. On off again, richest person in the world. I don't know if he is right now or not. Yeah. Wow. I mean, Are they that much of a eight hundred pound gorilla? Uh, sorry. Remind me of that reference. Oh, just the 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 big bully that kind of like comes in and and runs everything oh not at all i think they're i i personally i mean i've seen their like you know their headquarters and seen behind the scenes of their factory and stuff i love what they're working on i think their biggest problem i i feel like i'm saying a lot of very personal opinions here i think their biggest problem is they hired a lot of um bezos a handful years ago went around and was like all right we got to ramp up into, into you know really get this going and was really serious about it. I feel like he had a fire around 2018 when he's like, you know, we got to do this. So what's, he's like, we got to keep upsetting these, you know, uh, traditional launch markets, you know, like ULA and all this stuff. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to hire new CEOs and they're going to come straight from the traditional market, you know, like straight from the Mm -hmm. traditional Boeing CEO, you know, like, Mm -hmm. and you're not going to get disruptive industry by bringing in all of the old school players. You're going to end up with slow, you know, for instance, very uh, slow, <laughs> yeah, very slow. Uh, you know, it's that's not how you compete these days. It's not by doing bringing in the people that did it the old way. Mm-hmm. You, you bring in new, fresh talent. You know, and a lot of the people that worked there were, you know, at the I, I knew people, for instance, at the time that worked there, like kind of during the, the the switch, and they were frustrated that they went from quick iterations to stop iterating. It's time to time to put your pencils down. Like we have to start to build this stuff. And like, but there's flaws. We're still figuring out. Oh, just do it, you know. And yeah. the more traditional way of like, well, you better make sure it's good on paper before we build anything. Because once you build it, that's it, you know. Like, no more iterating. And I think that's that's the the biggest problem with them is that that mantra at the top. Like that has to come from the top of like mm-hmm. it's okay to to build a thousand of these things and and blow them all up and see what works and what doesn't just make sure that when you're doing it it's it's saving us money in the long run because you know you found a way to do it cheaper you find a way to do it better you know i I i've had people who work at blue origin reach out um and you know shoot emails to me and and i know they have a ton of really talented people there that are doing really great work and everything and i don't want to like criticize them but at the same time i just find myself constantly like blue origin what are you doing a lot of people have like, that. What frustration. are you actually doing? What's sad is that there is a team of people developing a rocket that, on all of their scales, forget SpaceX. I know that's always hard for people to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget SpaceX. If Blue Origin purely existed without SpaceX ever having walked in the door, what they're about to, our big air quotes around the word about to release yeah. with New Glenn, would be monumental. It would be the largest rocket flying, the most powerful rocket flying. It would be the first reusable rocket flying it'd be it'd be incredible people would be like no way you know and like where did this come from and i guarantee when it does launch it's going to be maybe the first one might have a problem but it will be a bulletproof workhorse like very quickly just because i think it's over engineered like crazy and it's you know traditionally engineered in that in that like it has to work mantra not like not the that it's okay if it fails mantra Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just it's just a shame that that's the world we live in, though, that we that we have to we do objectively have to compare everything to SpaceX. Well, like, I mean, 
I remember playing covering Blue Origin early, early on in my channel and kind of being like, man, you don't know. They're out there doing this stuff, but someday they're going to just show up and just blow everybody's minds and stuff. <laughs> and here I am now, like six years later, and it's just like, I mean, yeah, the new Shepherd's gone <laughs> up and, and put people up and everything, and that's cool. But it's like, uh, I, it's I the, know. uh, is that Tommy or is that, uh, no, it's, uh, what's the, is John Travolta, like the John Travolta gif oh, of the like, meme. yeah, just, it's, it's exactly that basically. Yeah. Um, well, I did a video a while back that was talking about, what was it actually about? I forget now. Um, but I was talking about dream chaser basically and how excited I am for dream chaser. And of course it's, it's booked for the Vulcan and mm -hmm. the Vulcan is being held up mm -hmm. by blue origin. And yeah. it was like, I kept talking about like, I, I forget, I forgot my own video now, but, uh, but whatever okay. was it like, I just kind of, it just kind of kept coming back to like, oh, it's being stalled by Blue Origin. Yeah. Like it just, that happened like three times in a row. And it's just like, <laughs> yeah. But the, and honestly, again, I really think from the outside perspective and the limited knowledge that I do have, it really feels like one of the biggest problems was the push to stop iterating on the BE4. Because the BE4 is a very advanced engine. It's extremely advanced. And when you are working with known flaws and known problems and you keep pushing into production and just certifying as opposed to fixing and reiterating on top of those, then you're likely just spending way more time and money and effort. I mean, think about how it's funny. The other day, Blue Origin posted excited that they had 4,000 seconds of, of test time on their BE7 their little, the little lunar hydrogen engine. That's, uh -huh. and that is like, that's getting up there for, you know, good numbers for qualification. Uh -huh. Meanwhile, I think SpaceX does that about every three days for testing <laughs> engines. And this is a the that started in 2018. Yeah. So five years of engine time for a new engine, SpaceX does in three days. Yeah. Has any Blue Origin engine gotten into orbit no see i'm just like you've been doing this 20 years they're really close <laughs> vulcan will be the first <laughs> i know it's frustrating yeah. because it is like be4 has great specs by all accounts again forget spacex forget mm -hmm. anything else we ever know that's a good engine and especially when it's like if it's reusable and they get all that figured out the you know the reliability of it long term and all that stuff it's got fantastic specs and it'd be a, a workhorse engine. Great. But yeah, it's painfully slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, well, I can't, I can't iterate enough that this is not any individual. If you're working on BE4. Totally. Yeah. I, mean, again, I always works. feel bad doing that. Cause yeah. I know there's some really good people that are working on it. And, and, and that there's always frustrations that they are going home every day going, I can't believe that my manager asked me, like they had to make us cut time because we weren't doing this. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, there's all, it's all complicated. It's all mm, hundreds of arms and legs trying to work cohesively together, you know, and literally, literally hundreds or thousands of legs and arms trying to move cohesively, you know, when you're talking about a company <laughs> of that scale yeah, and brains. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we put off recording this for a few days because they were going to make the announcement about Artemis 2. And I thought yeah. we could talk about that. Yes, that was exciting. Did you watch it? I did. Yeah. I didn't get I to was, watch it live. I watched it after. The I was hyped. Like, literally, as it was happening, I was just like, the excitement in the room. Like, I haven't seen it. Were you there? No, just oh, watching. Okay. Okay. I watched online, too. Yeah. Um, but, like, People were cheering and screaming like it was the most excitement I've seen in a, at a NASA event. And I think the whole time. That's true. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. awesome. It was great. What did you and think? I love the I love the pictures that well, there's a video. I could probably pull it up if I really wanted to, but it's like NASA stuff. But it looks like some kind of Marvel Cinematic Universe yeah. promo or something. They're like backlit. It looks like Iron Man in their suits and stuff. I was like, dude. The portraits? Have you seen the, the astronaut portraits? The official anyway. NASA astronaut portraits? I'll, I'll pull it up right now. Stunning. There are some like, people beautiful. actually watching this online. I don't know who did these. I mean, everything about... Yeah, I see the... the high, exactly. Like, looking at this page here. Look at those portraits. Are we sure that Jeremy Hansen isn't Buzz Lightyear? Look at that chin. No, I think he Look is. at that. 99% sure he is. <laughs> I'm going to have a really hard time 
I mean, obviously, I don't think they look that much alike, but Reed and Jeremy, to me, are... They, like, whenever I just glance at one, I don't know who it is. So I'll have to... You're, you're right, though. Jeremy is a lot more... Like, he has a very, like, square jaw, very yeah. Buzz Lightyear-esque. I'll, I'll remember that. Well, I feel like... Okay, so so for the people who might be listening or have, don't really know what's going on, so the, the four people that were chosen... I'll just... I'll just say it real quick. Uh, Reed Wiseman is the commander. Victor Glover is the pilot. Christina Koch is the mission specialist. And Jeremy Hansen from the CSA, the Canadian Space Agency, is the mission specialist on there. So there's four of them. Artemis 2 is going to basically do sort of, well, it's a different mission profile, but it's going to do what Artemis 1 did that's going to go around the moon, but it's going to have four people in there. And uh, this is like the Apollo 8 of the Artemis program. Yeah. I think that's a fair way of putting it. And it's not, it is only doing a lunar flyby as opposed to distant retrograde orbit. So it actually will not orbit the moon. It'll just be a flyby very similar to to Apollo 8. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, Those Artemis 1 did actually get into that weird distant retrograde orbit. Yeah, yeah. That's why I didn't want to say it's the same as Artemis 1. Yeah. They definitely did something weird with that. Yep. Very similar though. I just want to see if this will play. I don't know if people will be able to hear it. But look at this. Your moon mission that will be doing a similar flyby. The what? The Dear Moon mission. <laughs> similar fly but look at this, though. Look at this video. So epic. I don't know if people can hear the music, but... I can't even hear the music, so I'm just singing it in my oh, head. Okay. And, uh... Yeah. Okay, so what are the armpit things? What, what Do you know what those are? I think they're inflatable uh, water survival. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, because these are, these are their... The reason those are orange is so they stand out high visibility against water. Um, gotcha. you'll, yeah. you'll notice that, uh, for instance, Boeing's flight suit, if you ever notice that it's it's blue, mm-hmm. because they land on land ah, with the Starliner. So okay. blue would be, uh, it'd be a very severe thing if they did, if they were recovering in the water. Uh, the orange suits are expected to recover in, in water. Yeah, so contract. it would stand out against the, the bluish water. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Yep. Sp- yeah and I like how that. SpaceX just went with white. Yeah, that stands out against anything, really. Unless it lands in Siberia. That's true, actually. I mean, there is always a chance that it could, you know, total <laughs> off nominal like emergency reentry, and uh, you end up landing in, yeah, in snow. I guess you're right. They, they land in Antarctica and just like never get found because they blend too in too much. Camouflaged. <laughs> That'd be a <laughs> horror story. I mean, that, something like that happened that time with uh, that Soyuz mission that landed in water. That was not supposed to land in water. Are you familiar with that one? There's only one Soyuz that so. splashed down, and it almost led to the loss of the crew mm-hmm. because uh, it was like in the middle of a blizzard in this tiny. There's like one potential like it's a small lake, and it landed in the middle of this small lake, and it was like almost didn't get the crew out before hypothermia. Basically, uh-huh. like, it was just crazy. You know, in the, in the middle of a Siberian winter, like nuts. I need to brush up on that story, but it's it's crazy. I wonder if that was the uh, inspiration for gravity, because at the end she like lands in a lake in the middle of nowhere, and it's like, oh, that's that's convenient. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I feel like she lands like amongst like crazy cliffs in Vietnam or something, you know, like in Heilong Bay or something. Oh, that's she, true, because they're all yeah, those mountains and stuff. It's like, can you imagine if you landed right at the edge of one of those and just roll down, and that's what killed you? Like, <laughs> you survive, and I mean that is that's what's crazy is like. Most of the Earth, you can land on, you uh, know, splash down, no big deal, you're fine. But there's a couple places where you really, really would not want to land and roll off of, you know, like in the middle of a city, Manhattan, yeah. down a mountain, you know, I mean, pretty that's, that's, chances of that happening, obviously. Yeah. That's how I would end that movie is she goes through all that and survives and then like steps out of the lake and like a snake bites her <laughs> after all that. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I don't get to make movies. <laughs> but uh, no, these are some really cool shots. Um, speaking of making movies and, and space flight and stuff like that, I just have to give a quick shout out. Um, a handful of incredible 3D talent, 3D artists. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The orbital flight test video from Ryan Hansen Space. I it, should pull that up. It is incredible. But don't show the ending. I don't know if you watched to the end. I did. And I was surprised I did that. Yeah, but I won't reveal it. You have to go see it. You do. It's amazing. It's should I pull it up though, just to kind of see the? Uh... Yeah, just tease those graphics because right? it is inc- It's an. Isn't it amazing? These are like enthusiasts making films like this, like not being paid. You know, 
uh, two million dollars by a studio to produce something like this. Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. It's it, it's, it's, a, it's an amount of talent I don't have for sure. Oh, and it's it's kind of exactly. Wait, it's not a talent that I don't have. So it's a talent you have, Joe. Wait, say what now? You said it's not a talent I don't have. I stuttered. <laughs> gotcha. Hear that? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Scott, Mr. Arrogant, I can make any film guy. As yes, we I'm all so know. arrogant. I'm known for that. <laughs> uh, wait, what were you saying? Oh, yeah. I was saying this earlier, too, just like how amazing it is that um, that an individual can whip up 3D graphics like this. You know, I was talking at the time specifically about Casper Stanley. Yeah. But, I mean, this is obviously that as well and to a, an a insane level of animation and but it was a whole team of people that did this right it was so it all really is ryan's like work but a lot of people contributed okay so yeah seabass wigan chameleon circuit a lot of people like it, it's cool because the, the community a lot of people like someone has like really done an, an amazing um orbital launch tower render you know so they already have the model yeah someone yeah, 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 yeah. Done an amazing this or that and they're combining their works together and then Ryan put it all together as this animation and and um and Ring Watchers on on Twitter um Ryan did an, a different Ryan Ryzen or how, I forget how you say his name it's, it's spelled funny um did the score like on his mm. own the score is original like it's just crazy yeah it's really that's impressive. really cool though that like uh, uh, several different people had made all these different models and stuff and they just kind of kind of combined them and made this out of it to have somebody look utterly frankly realistic like as good as a lot. That's what we want to see. i mean it's honestly as good of a of a render as the official spacex or, or in some ways better than the official space and all these little details i mean the, the storyline and like the fact they show like the screens and stuff and yeah yeah and mission control and i mean it is i was blown away the I, mist coming off of it exactly and i'm not saying like i i didn't have high expectations but i you know i put it on thinking like yeah, you know, they asked me to watch this, you know, and I follow the, their work and follow Ryan's work. And I was excited and like, this would be cool, you know, cool. That's neat that they made it. And I'm like, I'm 18 minutes. And I'm thinking, I don't know. And it, I watched every second of it. <laughs> well, yeah, every. I was like, how, how, why do you need 18 minutes to show a launch? Because they're usually like just a few minutes long or something. But uh, they, they kind of told the whole story here. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Really impressive. Although I'm pretty sure they're not going to try to catch the booster on this first Correct. launch. Right? And and S24, which is specifically labeled here, also has the payload bay door. He said that he just decided to tell a story out of it. And, and yeah, yeah. So oh oh, look at us nitpicking some other yeah. creator. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, no, and it made for a, a more compelling storyline. I think you know to have. Someone, someone did say I would, it would have been really ironic. So for a little bit, they're showing like you know the flexing and like the preparing of the arms for the catch. Mm -hmm. They show and tease the re-entry and everything and make it feel like it's right about to catch. And then all of a sudden, you just see way off in the distance the booster falling <laughs> in the water. That would have been funny. Yeah. Were but... you saying in your the, the video that came out today? You were saying something about that the uh, you actually wouldn't see the flame that much. It's. I mean, I think Ryan's render of it's pretty accurate, but it won't leave like a smoke trail. You know, yeah. like like a kerosene mm -hmm. rocket leaves a pretty a reasonably dark trail. Obviously, like solid rocket boosters, like the space shuttle. So if you can't find it in the sky, you won't have like a a line to be able to point to. You know oh, what I mean? Okay. That, okay. That's kind of what I meant. I, I yeah. realized I maybe worded it a little bit ambiguously. Like, but but the flame itself, you'd be able to see. Yeah, it'll I mean, it'll look a lot like that. I think. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, what's funny? So you know, Relativity just launched a week ago or whatever. Yeah. First Methalox, well. Not the first one. It didn't make it to orbit, and neither did the Chinese one. But one of the first rockets, orbital class, you know, mm -hmm. Methalox rockets to to get into space, I guess. There we go. That's a fine definition of it. Um, <laughs> the photographers out there and, and the people that watched it in person said it was really dim. Oh, yeah. It was not bright, which is which is fascinating. I guess it makes sense. There's not – most of the, like, the bright stuff that we normally see coming out of exhaust is carbon being burned, and it just burns bright, bright orange. Um, and so there's not almost any, you know, there's a little bit of carbon being burnt in CH4. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty that, I mean, like also that's a small class rocket. It's not, yeah. you know, it's not, uh, the biggest, most powerful rocket to ever fly, but I just don't expect it to be that bright either. I don't know. I mm. guess we'll, we'll see soon. Well, I will stop just giving away their, uh, yeah. Yeah, don't, thing here. I know, especially because I'm sure the screen recording is like 
two frames a second too. Probably, yeah, yeah. My probably. show, so whoever is watching this is like, seeing this like this show. is terrible. Yeah. What are they talking about? Why did they said it was good? <laughs> um, but no, actually, so the funny you mentioned relativity. That was to me the most. Uh, well, okay. Everybody was focusing on the 3D printing part of it, which is really cool, obviously. But like to me, it was like this is the first time we're really going to see a methane powered rocket go off. I mean, I guess the Chinese one, but I hadn't seen that one yet. Um, and I was like, that that's what I wanted to see. Cause I know that's what, you know, Starship is gonna look like, but times 50 or something, you know. And um, I thought it was really cool just seeing that blue flame. Mm -hmm. Like it's I mean, we I've that's seen like, a lot of rocket launches and that was different. That was new. It was to me. Very different. And the pictures too. It's yeah. night night was a bad and a good thing. You know what I mean? Like yeah. everyone wants to see the beautiful daytime shots, but I'm I'm almost thinking like I don't know if you'd hardly see the flame on that thing at, during the day. Like it was dim, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not a bright, well, like the space shuttle, the, the Delta. Okay. It's funny. Cause I don't know if I ever, the space shuttles RS 25, right. Um, does not burn any carbon. The actual flame coming out of the main space shuttle engines is virtually transparent. I don't know. I would love to see a vehicle fly just on, mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to think right now if there has ever been a hydrogen powered first stage that does not have an ablative, uh, nozzle like the because the Delta IV Heavy is hydrogen first stages and Delta IV, but it has a ablative carbon nozzle, so it sh still shoots a bright orange flame because it's ablating that that mm -hmm. carbon nozzle. So it's still really bright orange, and you don't get that like fun transparent. But I would love to see if doesn't really make sense on a booster stage, but I would like to see that. Yeah, I got yeah, you. yeah, mm -hmm. that would be. I'd just be curious how much dimmer it is or you know, compared to methane, I think methane is brighter, but uh -huh. nothing beats Carelox. Carelox is like, I remember when, when the, uh, or I guess well, the solid rocket boosters, when, um, <laughs> when SLS took off, it, I had no, I never know what to say when they, I, I half prepare something in my head of like, here's the start of the Artemis program, a new generation of yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, something, something, something. And instead my first words are, oh my God, always. And then yeah. followed this time by, it's so pause 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 bright <laughs> like, <it was laughs> completely stained my eyes uh, how bright it, those solids burned i mean it that was, was at night too wasn't it it was at night yeah yeah it was no i could hardly like i intentionally kind of started like doing this a little bit so i wouldn't strain my eyes because by the time it after booster separation i had a really hard time seeing the the really really dim uh core dim spot i oh big time it was like a i mean it was a stain like the center of my whole uh, vision was was blurred or like blinded you know it's crazy yeah. that was the brightest i mean falcon heavy too is surprising even during the day i haven't seen a falcon heavy at night um but it's it's surprising how bright the flame is um yeah i'd be curious though I, i'm i'm really excited to see starship I, I wonder how it's going to compare yeah uh i think it's time to wrap this up because we've been going for a while i'm not yeah. i'm not trying to be lex friedman on you here with a five-hour podcast <laughs> I don't know how you could speak the next day after all that. It was my voice is sore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was cool though. Um, he does cool stuff. Yeah. Um uh, but dude, uh, we need to get together soon. Yeah. Somehow, some way. Well, you need to come down to Austin when I'm there, because I'm there often and we need to hang out and have a weekend or something. Totally. I invited yeah. you that one time. Granted it was last minute and what was my deal? I think I you had, for some reason. I think you had either family over or plans oh it was new year's it was new year's oh okay i don't remember i think you already just had plans i was like yeah. oh maybe i should have thought of this before like three days before you know <laughs> <laughs> well i'll tell you yeah. um there's uh, uh was i telling you about the luxury bus line yes well i know we talked about it actually i think the last time we we're on our little does that go between dallas and austin um i think they go between well i took it from houston so there's a dallas houston there's a dallas austin and san antonio i believe Hey. That sort of Dallas triangle or that Texas triangle kind of thing. Keep going. I'm just saying like, uh, that's kind of where I am now. If I ever go down to Austin for something outside of like seeing my, my wife's family, they live in Georgetown, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's like uh -oh. flying first class and you can yeah. like work and it's just, yeah. it's pretty cool. I was going to say the other thing I did this the other day, I got stuck, uh, in Dallas and I had to get down there for South by and mm -hmm. American wasn't rebooking me until like over 24 hours after I was supposed to originally arrive. And I'm like, I can't, I can't do that. You know, and South by or Southwest tickets were like 500 for that leg. I should have just rented a car, but it was really late. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. 
do this. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I booked with JSX. Have you heard of that? Mm -mm. It's like a small charter almost. It was oh. cheaper than Southwest. Uh huh. But just like EJ 145s or something like really, you know, small, normally like a airliner, like American Airlines. We used to fly them out of Waterloo where it's like one seat and two seats. Yeah. So tiny. They removed, instead of it being two seats, they're all like kind of first class style, you know, one, 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 one. Has Starlink. I woke up, get this. My flight was at 748. They only, they their hub is out of, out of Dallas, out of Love Field. Okay. And I, my flight was at 740 a.m. I woke up intentionally at 7 a.m. <laughs> that just keep people panic attack thinking about that for a normal airline. Yeah, yeah. They just operate out of a hangar, so you just like I stayed like right next door and got there at seven twenty and hop walked on an airplane. And then literally they have Starlink, so you just sit there with your laptop open. They don't make you like put them away or anything, and just work the whole time. And okay, was, I'll look into that. That's cool. It was fun. <laughs> it just it purely from like, and those were even inflated prices because still because of. Uh, south by southwest sure, yeah. but generally like it's hilariously reasonable i mean i was surprised it was huh. like it's competitive and it's really it was just fun it was a fun experience isn't it funny when you find things that are like super luxurious and she she but it's really not that expensive yeah not at when all you, when you actually I, do it and you're just like really i had people on twitter being like oh mr you know posh i know right? yeah this was tw half the price of south southwest like i don't know what you expect from me you know <laughs> Yeah, it, it, but and it, I, it, those are my joys in life is finding a good deal on something that's that feels like a fun, you know, unique experience like that yeah. for sure. Well, we were in uh, Vegas recently, and um, I don't, I'm not really a Vegas kind of guy, but we were there over my birthday, so I was like, eh, splurge a little, you know, whatever. And we needed a rental car because we we're going to be driving around a little bit. But um, I went on Turo and I found a Maserati. Oh no way! <laughs> How is that? How is it driving a Maserati? Um, uh, got stared at a lot. That was kind of cool. Um, but I mean, it was, it was, look, it was more expensive than getting like a budget rental car or something like that. But, but it was, it wasn't that much more. Right. Yeah. Tr especially like if you're getting like a four year old luxury car, like it's probably similar to getting like an SUV on. At Hertz. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, I think I mean. it was a 2018 or something like that, but yeah. Um, it was a really cool car. Well, I was going to say, you feel like it's like a much bigger experience and yet people will, you know, but that's probably the thing though, like the experience of it is worth, a little bit of extra money and and it's and it's a little bit it wasn't like obnoxious anyway right yeah, i was yeah. just kind of blown away it's like you can do this that's cool <laughs> this is something people can do you can just do this and uh, someday someday i i actually don't like you know you go well people people look at you that was cool i that i don't want to be like looked at like i have that like the mm -hmm. fear like just don't look at me you know uh -huh. um but I would love just for the joy of driving like a, a Lamborghini or a Ferrari, you know, just to experience that mm. uh, childhood. I mean, I'd love to run a Countach, but those are also horrible cars to drive from my understanding. <laughs> um, but I still would love it. The last VidCon that I went to, I stayed at the the standard house and uh, the real engineering guy and the real life lore guy went in on a Lambo. Yes. And that was just like parked in front of the house. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, did did they have? have and you fun could hear them it? coming all the way down the street too. <laughs> like you like knew when they were coming. <laughs> See, that's, that's fun. I like that. You know, for yeah. a short period of time, do something wild. Why not? Weekend. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you get on with your day. But dude, um, I miss talking to you all the time. You know, this is good. This is why I didn't want to. This is why we went so long because it's been so long. Uh, oh. But uh, I'm super happy for you. I'm proud of you, and I love you, and I want to see you again soon. Yeah, let's hang out in real life. And also, I have to say again, congratulations on the new studio set. Oh, I think it looks beautiful. I well, genuinely it. love it. I think you did a great job. I great vibe. It. it feels it feels right for the channel. Cool. Yeah, I love these 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 LEDs back here. It's, that might be my new thing. I mean, yeah. clearly you've you've got something similar going on, but like, yeah, it's yeah. it's just fun. It I love how it lights the room. Yep, it's awesome. Oh, oh, I gotta show you. Well, I'll I'll save it for afterward. That's it. <laughs> oh. oh. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody go check out Tim's channel if you haven't already. Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, my good friend. Thanks for doing this. Hopefully this whole episode isn't completely out of date by the time it comes out because the Starship maybe has already gone up. Um, or hopefully it has. I don't, I don't know what I want right now. 
But if it hasn't yet, you can guarantee that Tim will be covering it over on his YouTube channel, The Everyday Astronaut. I feel like most listeners in this podcast are well aware of Tim, but if you haven't followed Tim yet and you have any interest at all in space, he's really doing some of the most in-depth coverage you can find anywhere. He's super good at what he does, and I'm proud to call him a friend. So definitely go check him out. Uh, one little bit of uh, house cleaning business. If you don't know, I do have a new website, and it's kind of the new hub for all my stuff, my main channel, TMI, this podcast. Uh, you can find all my older interviews on there, and as I branch off into more non-YouTube-related stuff, you'll be able to find that there, too. So it's thatjoescott.com. So if you're looking for a, a Joe Scott website and somebody says, which Joe Scott, you can say, that Joe Scott, and boom, you're there. So that's what makes it simple. Uh, you can find all the merch around my channels there. There's cool T-shirts, mugs, posters, and a lot more cool stuff on the way. Uh, so go check it out. Every time you purchase something, not only do you get something cool, but it does help support this channel and uh, and everything that I got going on. It's really helpful and I appreciate it. This episode was produced by Kimmy Britt, edited by Bray Brown. I'm Joe Scott. You can find me at Answers with Joe pretty much everywhere on the socials. Of course, my YouTube channel is Answers with Joe. Anyway, thanks a lot for listening. Please do share this if you thought it was interesting and a nice review on whatever podcast player you're using right now really does go a long way. I appreciate that. But until next time, thanks. Have a good one. Now go out there and start some conversations of your own. Take care.